America in 1968 was a year of assassinations, deep divisions, and grim warnings about black-white relationships. A presidential candidate came on the scene who focused many of his campaign speeches on healing those racial divisions. We'll never know if he might have succeeded because he was brought down by an assassin's bullet. Of course, I'm referring to Robert F. Kennedy. His son, Bobby Jr., has a new book out about his father and his famous family. And we recently spoke about that and about today's tumultuous political landscape. The book is entitled American Values, Lessons I Learned from My Family. Here is that interview. Watch. Your wonderful father, Bobby Kennedy, was assassinated 50 years ago. Are we more or less divided now than in 68, when you were just a little kid? I think the, the divisions now are more systemic because they're economically rooted. Um, I think one of the you know, big things that has happened to polarize our country is um, are these giant gaps between rich and poor, the, the hollowing out, the erosion of the middle class, um, and, and then the, the giant tsunami influx of money into politics. And the effect of that, and it's something that I, I saw a lot, I, you know, I spent a lot of my childhood in Latin America, and when I was going there, almost all of those governments were military governments. The societies were characterized by a big gap between rich and poor, and when that happens, the role of one political party becomes to protect the perks and privileges of the wealthy class, and uh, in order to do that, you have to polarize the population. You have to uh, use all of the alchemies of demagoguery to point to people who are the enemies and polarize your society. And so I think, you know, there were issues that divided us in the 60s. There was drugs, there was Vietnam, there was civil rights. Um, but those were genuine disputes about ideology, and they weren't really rooted in, in class divisions. And I think they become much more intractable when they're rooted in class divisions. Would you say it's worse now? Yeah, I would say it's worse now. You're in such an extraordinary family, the Kennedy family, given so much, been a part of the American scene for so long. Do, do you think you were raised with an idea of service? Well, it's some kind of public service, but you know, it was all it was all around us because we were, you know, we were, um, as I talk about in the book, we were in the immersed in political campaigns. We were surrounded by people who were all driven by um, by purpose, by a sense of purpose. Um, I did. I made a trip in nineteen. 65 with my father to Europe and we went to France and Germany and Greece and England and we went to um, We went to Italy and, and to Poland, which was then a communist country yeah. Where we were disinvited the government said we don't want you here and we went anyway And the government blacked out our trip. So there was no mention of it on the news In fact when we went to an orphanage with presents for the orphanage for the orphans, and all the orphans were removed before we got there by the government because they didn't want us to have any contact with the people. But nevertheless, through word of mouth, the, the, the knowledge of our presence spread. And when we went to the cathedral in Krakow, Krakow for mass, we came out, and there were 250,000 people in the square in Krakow Square, and many of them had somehow got a hold of these little tiny American flags and were waving them at us. And they were singing, they lifted our car, literally. They sang this this song called Stolat, Lat, which Poles only sung to their most popular heroes and leaders that had never been sung by a crowd in the communist era. And it was very wow. deliberative. And, you know, I saw those kind of crowds in every country we went to, the communists and the non-communist people. It was very clear to me that people were hungry for our leadership. They were, um, they recognized America's moral authority. They wanted, um, they wanted our leadership. They knew the difference between leadership and bullying. But Kennedy's a raise with that. Well, yeah, Almost. but I, when, when, what I'm saying is it was all around us, you know, that... 
it was a privilege to lead a purposeful life. Um, and I think, you know, my uh, people say to me a lot, you know, are you doing environmental advocacy because, you know, your father taught you to do service. To me, it's a privilege to be able to, do, to live the kind of life I lived and to be in those fist fights every day to do something, you know, to try to, to, to make some benefit in the world. There's another Kennedy on the horizon, your nephew, Joe Kennedy. He's Joe Kennedy III from Massachusetts. He's sometimes mentioned as a dark horse for Speaker of the House. You see that possibility? I have no idea. I haven't even talked to him about if he's interested in it. But, you know, he's a, uh, he's a, he's a genuine leader. So oh, I, I wouldn't be surprised about any level of success that he meets with. He's got it. No. Yeah, he has, mm. he has every gift. Where's your party, the soul of the day? We're discussing about that at breakfast today. If your party goes left, left, you're going to lose. You have to. Your if if your father were alive, he'd be a progressive today, right? He was a progressive then. You're a progressive. Can the progressives win the national election? Don't they have to come together with the center of the Democratic Party? You know, I, I'm not smart enough to be able to tell you what the Democrats ought to be doing. I think if there's, um, I, you know, I think the, the success of the party is going to be dependent on whether good leaders who are, um, who, who, are, who are talking the truth and who are reminding Americans about what this nation is supposed to represent and making us feel like we're all part of one, you know, enterprise rather than driving us apart. I think those, um, you know, those are issues. I mean, listen, my father, my father ran, he brought people together. Oh, he know. ran, he, 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 and, you know, that, my, that last uh, train ride that I took with him when we brought him from from Penn State or from uh, Penn Station in New York to Union Station in Washington D.C., there were two million people on the on the train track, and there were white people and black people and rabbis and priests, and um, there were nuns and there were people in military uniform, and there were hippies and tie dyed and you know uh, radical black militant radicals and every kind of it was a cross section of the American people, and they were all people who had participated in his campaign and who um, who believed, who were, were made to believe that they were part of something that would, that would allow them to step outside of their narrow self-interest and do something good. But he was a great leader I, of a Four crusade. years after my father died, those, the demographic data show that most of those white people who had stood along those train tracks voted in 1972, not for George McGovern, who was aligned with my father, but rather for George Wallace, who was an avowed segregation, who was antithetical to everything my father believed in. And it struck me then, and it has, it's you know, been reinforced many times since, that every nation, like every human being, has a darker side and a lighter side, and the easiest thing for a politician to do is to appeal to our greed, our self-interest, our fear, our anger, our bigotries, our prejudice, the stuff that Donald Trump is now doing. And it's much more difficult, but often more successful, to, to remind Americans that we can't advance ourselves as a people by leaving our poor brothers The better nature behind. of our souls. Yeah. Yeah. You uh, had a three-hour meeting with uh, the man who killed your father, Sirhan Sirhan. Is that in the book? No. Why did you meet with him? I met with him because I had done a... I had been urged by Paul Schrade, who was one of my father's closest friends and political allies. He was the United Auto Workers official who had recruited Cesar Chavez to the, um, to the United Farm Workers. He was a civil rights advocate. He was absolutely trusted by my father. He worked on my father's California campaign, and when my father was shot, 
Paul Schrade was the first one shot. He was probably shot by the first of two bullets that were fired by Sir Hand toward my father. He was hit in the head and the bullet was removed from, from his head. The, um, the, and Paul, for many years, has been convinced that Sir Hand did not, Sir Hand's bullets never reached my father. My father- You believe um, that two shooters? Yeah, well, the, and, and this is, you know, Paul has been trying to get me involved for a decade in this case, and I finally, it was hard for me to say no to him. I finally went and spent time with him, and he had me read the autopsy report, which was a, um, you know, the autopsy, anybody who reads the autopsy report, the autopsy report, there were 77 people in that room. Every one of them says Sir Han was always in front of my father, and most of them say he never got within three feet. The majority say five feet, but always from in front. The, according to Thomas Noguchi, who is probably the best coroner in I America, know, he, my father, the bullets, the, the four bullets that struck my father were all fired from behind. They were fired, they were contact shots, which means the barrel of the gun was actually touching my father's body when the trigger was pulled. What did Sirhan tell Noguchi you? And Noguchi came to the conclusion that Sirhan could not have killed So there were father. two shooters? Yeah. What did Sirhan say? Sirhan believes that there were two shooters. Did he have a connection with the second shooter? No, he, he has no memory of He's been consistent for 40 years or 50 years in saying that he has no memory of what happened that night. So how did you spend And most of the people, I mean, virtually all the, all the psychiatrists who have examined him have said he's telling the truth. He has no memory. So what did you spend time talking about? Well, I, I'm not going to talk about what I, the okay. specifics of what I talk about. Uh, can we ever solve that? Can we solve it? It should be investigated. Mm. The murder has never been investigated. You know, because Sir Han pled guilty, Sir Han had a lawyer who was a, was a lawyer who represented Johnny Roselli, uh, a mobster who had been involved in the CIA assassination plots. And, he, and that attorney had urged Sir Han to plead guilty and to avoid a trial in which his guilt would be disputed. So there was a short um, panel or uh, sentencing hearing in which the narrative was recited, but nobody ever investigated, nobody ever looked at the bullets. The, the bullets that hit my father, there's been seven uh, ballistics experts who have examined the bullets that hit my father. None of them could have come from Sir Han's gun. They came from a different gun. So. Clearly. Didn't Noguchi come forward and say something? And Noguchi says it in his biography. And in fact, Noguchi was fired by the L.A. Uh, d d district attorney at that time because he wouldn't tell the line. Because he was, you know, he was saying this: these bullets could not have come from Sir Han's guns. And then this he was rehired under pressure from the Japanese community and from other people. I knew Noguchi. He's quite a guy. Yeah. The book, American Values, it's part personal memoir, part political history. Why'd you write it? I, um, I wrote it because nobody, there's been over a thousand books about my family and nobody from my family has ever written what it was like from the inside. And there's so much misinformation now. Um, about my family, you know, stuff uh, going from my, you know, my, a lot of it is slanderous. And my grandfather was a bootlegger that, that, are, that, are, that you know, that my, uh, my grandfather had relationships with mobsters that they fixed the 1960s election and on and on and on. And those things are so embedded in the no. psyche of the, on the American political landscapes that people just accept them as true and none of them have anything to do with the truth. And a part of this, um, the book is kind of straightening the record out, looking at the facts on those issues. And some of it is as kind of a, um, a, a, my gift to 
my children and their 105 Kennedy cousins um, mm. who who are part of our family and part of all the you know the gestalt of what it means to be part of our family. And it was my attempt to explain to them our family's role in American history. The last chapter of the book is about your mother, who's 90 now, right? Yeah, she just turned 90. How is Ethel? She's wonderful. She's an amazing woman. I was at the She's wedding. She's funny and, and sharp and, you know, a great storyteller. She's still up there in Hickory really Hill? Fun. She, no, um, she sold Hickory Hill about uh, 10 years ago. And she now lives in Palm Beach during the winter, and she's at the Cape uh, the autumn, spring, and summer. You praise her, but you also say there were times when her love didn't feel unconditional. You... I had a tumultuous relationship, which I talk about in the book with, with your my mother? mother from the time I was born. <laughs> and that... Really? Um, yeah. And... Um, and when I was young, I couldn't see these really heroic qualities that she has as clearly as what, I can what now. What were you mad at? I was just, I, you know, I was a rebellious kid. I think that, um, you know, and, and like my own kids are constantly, I have six children of my own and Cheryl has one, but, the, you know, they're, they're constantly looking for evidence of hypocrisy or, you know, or whatever, me not living up inconsistencies and, you know, my... Challenging burning. kids. Yeah, and I think that's what kids have to be. I think you're, you're supposed to divorce your parents. You're supposed to, and some people do it at, a, at an older age. I did it at a very young age. So I, you know, her rules I experienced as petty ty tyrannies that didn't make any sense, and I spent a lot of time running away from home and, and doing things. That, and then I got involved with drugs after my dad's death, and of course that inflamed the whole relationship. So I was unable to see um, all of these extraordinary qualities that my mother has, um, and then I got sober, you know, in my 29 years old, and I then had six kids of my own, and I began to marvel at, you know, <laughs> how do you get 11 kids to kneel and say the rosary every night? How do you get them all to show up on time for dinner with their hair brush and their, you know, their nails brush and their hair comb? And force everybody to, um, to participate in a single conversation where sidebars are, you know, are illegal and um, wow. and all of the, and then you know force us to memorize poetry and go to mass every day in the summer, sometimes twice a day. Um, and you know you start to appreciate that when you have kids of your own. Robert, you're a great American. It's an honor knowing you. Thank you, Larry. The same. Hello everyone, welcome. Thank you so much for coming out tonight and braving the traffic and the parking issues. Oh my goodness, but we're very glad to have you here and hopefully we're gonna have a very entertaining and fun evening together. I'm Heidi Ganahl, I'm one of your CU Regents at large and I'm the founder of the Free To Be Coalition along with Neelam Desai and Madison Meeks as well as Marcus Fatenos who's not here tonight as well. And Madison is the leader of our Free To Be Student Club at CU Boulder, so let's give her a hand. She was amazing in putting all of this together. Thank you, Madison. The Free to Be Coalition is an effort by leaders on college campuses here and across the nation to encourage students to challenge their beliefs through the guarantee of free speech and intellectual debate. Our hope is to honor the words of the great President Bruce Benson, our president here previously for C at CU for 11 years, that we should teach students how to think, not what to think. The Free to Be Coalition launched our campus efforts early last year with the Vincente Fox, Nigel Farage debates here and at UCCS by bringing diverse voices to campus. Free to Be then followed up those debates with a candidate debate in the fall of 2018 and a panel discussion on the opioid crisis last spring. We will continue to bring forth important and timely issues that are relevant to the community in order to promote and demonstrate healthy civil discussion and expose students to different perspectives. These days, you seldom find real debates over important public issues on our college campuses. That is the finding of political science professor George Lanou in his book, Silent Stages. 
Lanou writes, debates can create recognition and a space for dissenting ideas that will enrich classroom discussions, research agendas, and hiring decisions. Policy debates can function like tilling exhausted soil so that new life can grow. Exhausted soil, <laughs> that's a good description of many college campuses. And as a region, I can attest, we do get exhausted sometimes. But we are free to be believe that what is lacking is respectful and intellectual combat. Perhaps some of our students at CU who are utterly certain of their correctness might utter at the end of this debate like this, wait, I never thought about that. That's what we hope for. Our other hope tonight is to open your mind, to model for our students what feisty collaborative debate looks like and how we might re-examine where the intersection of right and wrong exists. 60 years ago, Chief Justice Earl Warren warned our nation that we had a choice. Either teachers and students must always remain free to inquire, to study, and to evaluate, or our civilization will stagnate and die. There was no third option. We're at a turning point in our country's history. The Free to Be Coalition aims to turn us towards respect, to listening to each other, and to finding the best solutions for the biggest problems by hearing from all sides. We ask each of you to model this tonight, respect and openness, and to hear both perspectives and to ask clarifying questions at the end to help you come to the best conclusions. Tonight's discussion will be moderated by Guy Benson, political editor of townhall.com, a regular guest on NPR's All Things Considered, and the host of the nationally syndicated Guy Benson Show, along with Matthew Burgess, assistant professor of environmental studies here at CU Boulder and a member of the Heterodox Academy. Also joining us tonight are Alex Epstein and Robert Kennedy Jr. Sorry, Alex Epstein. Alex, I knew I was gonna do that, I'm so sorry. Robert is an agent of, agent of change among environmental activists who holds a bold vision for America's future in which energy independence and sustainable technology revitalize the nation's economy. As president of the board for Waterkeeper Alliance, Kennedy continues to lead the fight against those that pollute the nation's waterways. Robert cemented his reputation as a high profile activist with the publication of Crimes Against Nature, which called into question the country's environmental policies. He has also been involved with numerous clean tech corporate and venture capital groups. Despite his presentations, it's easy to see why Robert was named one of Rolling Stone Magazine's 100 Agents of Change. His expertise is evident and his passion palpable as he outlines the steps we can take to reduce the national debt and increase U.S. economic competitiveness by investing in the development of sustainable technologies. Robert believes it is truly possible to protect the planet and make the world a better place for future generations. Alex Epstein is a philosopher who argues that human flourishing should be the guiding principle of industrial and environmental progress. He founded Center for Industrial Progress in 2011 to offer a positive pro-human alternative to the green movement. Alex is the author of The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, a New York Times bestseller, arguing that if we look at the whole picture, human flourishing requires that humanity use more fossil fuels, not less. The book has been widely praised as the most persuasive argument ever for our continuing use of fossil fuels, winning Epstein the most original thinker of 2014 award from the McLaughlin Group. Alex is known for his willingness to debate anyone, anytime, and has publicly debated leading environmentalist organizations such as Greenpeace, the Sierra Club, and 350.org over the mortality of fossil fuel use. He has made his moral case for fossil fuels at dozens of campuses, including Harvard, Yale, Stanford, and Duke, his alma mater. I'd like now, now to bring up all of our speakers and our moderator, Guy Benson, to take the stage and kick our discussion off tonight. Thank you. Good evening. Good to see you all out here. Uh, as you just heard, my name is Guy Benson, uh, and I felt like I would just begin by offering a note of transparency. Uh, so with my background and what I do for a living, I think it's important for me to say right out of the gate that I am not unbiased. I think it's preferable for people in my line of work in the media to disclose where we're coming from rather than pretending to be neutral arbiters if we're not. So I am center-right. I'm a conservative. I'm Trump skeptical, I think you could say. Um, I do political reporting, analysis, and commentary at Fox News and at townhall.com as well. You did hear NPR, all things considered. They, they let me on from time to time, uh, which is nice. I enjoy 
doing bubble busting exercises because I think sometimes we're in our own bubbles and that can be unhealthy. And one of the busting bubble or bubble busting exercises that I have enjoyed in the past, I've attended maybe four to five conferences on world affairs here at CU Boulder, uh, which has been a learning experience. I, I have sat in this very ballroom on this very stage being outnumbered four to one on very low-key, uncontroversial issues like guns and abortion. Um, <laughs> and it was fine, a little hissing and booing uh, never, never uh, deterred me. Uh, but it's always great to be back in Colorado, to be back in Boulder. And I have to say, about five weeks ago, I just married a Coloradan. So it's a special treat to be here, although he went to school up the road in Fort Collins. So he was trying to get me to say, go Rams. I'm like, no, no, no. It's go buffs tonight, for sure. I have to, I have to ingratiate myself to the crowd. Um, so right school, right conference, let's be clear. Um, on this broader issue, so in my work, I'm a generalist. I am not an expert like either of these guys are. I like to think that I can think things through on my feet and ask fair questions, but I'm not an expert. My overall approach, again, in the interest of transparency, I believe that climate change is real. I believe that humans contribute to climate change very significantly. I believe taking action to combat climate change is morally the correct thing to do and something that we ought to pursue uh, in terms of policy. I am skeptical of some of the government-centric solutions um, that are sometimes floated, just to be just to put that out there. I'm also skeptical of doing so just as the United States if some of our global competitors don't have the same type of skin in the game. But I think because it is such an important issue, I'm very curious about what the right solutions look like. And I think what's exciting about an event like this tonight, we're not up here debating whether climate change exists. That is not what this debate's gonna be. There's no one up here saying, it's a total hoax made up by China. <laughs> that's funny. It's so true. It's very true. Uh, it's not true. Uh, so that's, that's not the starting point, right? We, I think, we'll tease this out a little bit, but we have something of a similar starting point. And then the question is, okay, how serious is the problem? What's the timeline? And what is realistic and correct to do about it? Uh, so with that, that's not a comprehensive uh, take on what I believe, but I wanted to give you a sense of where I come from. My general goal tonight is to keep the train on the tracks, foster a good conversation, and let each of these gentlemen build their case in a fair way. Um, so what we're going to do is start with opening statements. Each gentleman will have 15 minutes uh, to... 20 minutes. Oh, they, they told me 15. They changed it. 20 sounds fine to me. Uh, I was not going to turn off your microphone, but I was, I'd start like nudging you and then like maybe dousing with some water. But 20 minutes it is. Uh, and then we'll go to some questions from me and then some questions from all of you. Uh, well, maybe some of you. Uh, so we'll begin with Mr. Kennedy. Right. Um, I first want to start by apologizing for my voice. I, uh, um, I used to have a very, very strong voice. And when I was 42 years old, I got struck by a, a, a neurological illness called spasmodic dystonia, and it makes my voice tremble. Usually, when I speak for a while, it flattens out a little, and it becomes less painful for people to listen to. Um, so I'm hoping that happens. Some days it's bad, some days it's good. Today is particularly bad. Um, but I'm happy to be here, and the, the question that was presented, at least on the poster that I read for the first time today, uh, should the government come in and abolish all fossil fuels? And I would have to say that that would not be my approach. I don't think that, I agree with Ben that that kind of um, aggressive government intervention is, would not have a good outcome, and I don't believe in that. I'm a very market-based person. I spent 35 years representing commercial fishermen who were capitalists and um, in love with a capitalist system and wanted it to work for them. I spent the last 20 years in the green tech space, at least for part of my time. I was involved with the construction of the biggest um, solar thermal plant, the concentrated solar plant in 
America with one of my companies, and um, I also, one of my partners, was a partner in a group that funded Tesla. We were the largest and first funder. Another group that I continue to advise and have a stake in has built the largest PV, a solar plant in North America. I've been involved in construction of transmission and wind and many other things. And I believe in markets. And I believe that, that the market will reply ultimately the best solution. Um, Lord David Putnam gave a speech before Parliament about 10 years ago when Parliament was debating. I, I believe that at capitalism, people have asked me for 30 years, what's the best thing that could happen to the environment? And I always said the same thing. True free market capitalism, which we don't have in this country. We have corporate crony capitalism. Capitalism where if you want to bring a product to market, you pay all the costs of getting it there, including the cost of cleaning up your mess, which was a lesson we were all supposed to learn in kindergarten. Lord David Putnam gave a speech before Parliament, like I said, about 10 years ago. And Parliament was debating a cap and trade system that was designed to impose market discipline on the discharge of carbon. It was a way that was invented by conservatives, cap and trade. It was a way of saying, you're dumping your waste into the public commons, you ought to pay something for it. And something that will incentivize better behavior. That's how market works. And um, in, in Parliament, in England, virtually everybody understands the urgency of climate change. Very, very strong support for this law, and they ultimately passed it. But there were vested interests in others who said, we have to be careful. We, we have to move incrementally. We can't move precipitously because it will create the economy. Lord Putnam gave this wonderful speech where he reminded Parliament that 200 years before, the same body had debated the abolition of the slave trade. And at that time, everybody in England considered slavery a moral abomination, a cataclysm, morally. They knew it had to be abolished. But again, people said, we can't do it suddenly because slavery represented 25% of the GNP of Great Britain, and it was the principal source of energy for the entire British Empire, free human labor. And but after, and they said, if we abolish it overnight, the economy is going to collapse. But after a year of debate, Parliament made the moral choice and abolished slavery literally overnight, the slave trade. And instead of collapsing, the British economy exploded as tens of thousands of entrepreneurs rushed into that space to create new forms of energy, mainly mechanical ones, in an era that we now know as the Industrial Revolution which was the greatest epic and wealth creation in the history of mankind. And the abolition of slavery had exposed all of these hidden inefficiencies that were associated with free human bondage. Well, today, we don't need to abolish carbon to understand that our deadly addiction to it is the principal drag on American capitalism. The International Monetary Fund, which is not a liberal organization, says that the global subsidies to carbon today are $5.2 trillion. In the United States, we give subsidies to carbon $669 billion a year. That's more than we spend in our defense budget. It's 10 times what we spend on education. These are mature industries. Here, there may be an excuse for subsidizing a to jumpstart an industry, these are 100-year-old industries. There's no excuse that any of them should have subsidies. In addition to the direct subsidies, we have all the indirect subsidies, the things that I think, Alex, they don't exist with global warming, the ice caps melting, the wars, the acidification of the ocean. You know, the, the, um, the, my house today, my wife just called me before I walked in here and to tell me that we are under evacuation in California because of the second time in two years, 
I represent because the fire season lasts two months longer than it used to. I represent about 200 people who lost family members in the last fire or property. Yesterday, I was talking about Ben because he lives on Cape Cod too. I have a summer house on Cape Cod and, and the public dock, which has been there for 65 years, has been destroyed two years in a row for the first time ever. We just got hit by a Northeastern. I showed him pictures of that dock. We're all living with it. You know, Alex has a daunting problem, which is, to me, a daunting challenge. He not only has to disagree with, with 120 years of science, you know, 120 years ago, science is understood you put carbon in the atmosphere and warms it up. Exxon's own scientists, we now have their internal emails where they said this is going to heat the climate, it's going to melt the polar ice caps, and it's going to give us new drilling opportunities up there. And, but also, the insurance industry, which has its hair on fire, Swiss, we, Munich Re, biggest insurance companies in the world are saying this is the biggest threat to our business model, the military, the CIA, the Pentagon, report after report saying this is the biggest threat multiplier for the 21st century. Oh, but also just our common sense. He has to convince us not to believe our lying eyes. You know, the, I've watched, I've been scuba diving for 60 years. I've watched the coral fields disappear. The frogs are gone, the salamanders are gone. My children are living in a different world than I lived in. I go, you know, we have river keepers in 44 countries. The glaciers are melting on every continent. This is not something that is going to happen in the future. It's something that's happening today. And not only the global warming issues that, he, that you know, are part of that subsidy, that hidden subsidy, of the wars, the, um, the mercury in our fish. There's now, I buy a fishing license for 30 bucks every year. The New York State Constitution says that people this state own the fish. But every freshwater fish in New York State has mercury levels that are dangerous to eat. 19 states, all the fish have advisories. 49 states, some of them. We're living in a science fiction nightmare because of carbon today. Because that mercury is coming from coal burning power plants. I take my kids to the Adirondacks on the weekend. 20% of the lakes are dead. Zero life in them because of the acidification. All of the lakes on the high peaks of the Appalachians from Georgia to northern Quebec, acidified and dead. That's because I work and have litigated for 30 years in West Virginia. I see the legacy and the cost of this industry to our public. We have cut down the 500 biggest mountains in West Virginia. The coal industry has flattened an area larger than the state of Delaware. 1,200 miles of rivers have been buried by Phil. 2,500 poisoned. The water for almost all the major cities, Charleston and Morgantown, are poisonous. You can't drink them. You have to drink bottled water. This is a science fiction nightmare. This isn't something that's going to happen in the future. It's happening now. Now, here's the thing. Despite all these subsidies, we're still beating them in the marketplace. And I'm going to read something that I pulled up last night, last year. I'll tell you something really quick. Amory Lovin showed me he had two pictures he has. One was taken in New York at 38th Street, looking uptown, up Fifth Avenue, 1903. The other one, and there's, in that picture, there's 100 horse and buggies and one Model T Ford. He has another one taken in 1913, the exact same photo, this one, there's 100 Model T Fords and one horse and buggy. What happened? What happened was, in a 10-year period, Henry Ford dropped the, the price of the Model T by 67%. That's all that happened. Well, guess what? The price of the solar panels has dropped by 80% in the last five years. And five years before that, another 80%. So here's what's happening. And this, last year, 
We built, despite all the subsidies to carbon, we built 63% of the new capacity, generated capacity on the globe was wind and solar, was renewable. Here, I'm going to read you what I pulled up from Bloomberg last night. Bloomberg, these are the prices for wind and solar for all the energy sources. And this, Bloomberg tracks every transaction on the globe. These are super accurate numbers and up to date. Nuke, $267, a levelized, levelized cost a megawatt hour. What that means is the cost of financing the plant, the interest on the plant, the operation maintenance costs, the fuel costs all added up. 267. New coal, 112, about a half. New gas. Combined cycle, $57, about half what coal is. Wind, $42, a third less, and, and gas. Um, subsidized wind, it, that's unsubsidized. Subsidized wind is $11, one-fifth the cost of gas. Utility-scale solar, $26. So we could make energy if we want it by burning prime rib. Why wouldn't we use the cheapest form of energy? And I'll tell you why. Not only because of the subsidies. Even with the subsidies, we're beating them. But, oh well, let me do this quickly. Here's what's happening. I read an Alex book. I read your book last night. Thank it's you. interesting. <laughs> On the plane, I got here at 2 a.m. And I read your... Um, your debate, somebody gave me a transcript of your debate with Kevin. So in that you say, uh, no coal plant has ever been deployed this place by, so by renewable energy and never will. Here's what's happening okay, on the ground. That's not a quote, but. What? I don't think I said and never will, but. Uh, uh, you said not in our lifetime. So, no, here's what happened. NIBSCO, Indiana's biggest utility, is closing, announced that it's closing its two biggest coal plants and it's closing them to build new wind and solar because new wind and solar is cheaper than existing coal. Um, Excel, in this state, closing the Comanche plant for the same reason. Um, in Iowa, Iowa just announced that it is closed, the biggest utility in Iowa, it is bringing, buying six gigawatts of solar and wind power mainly to display his coal, and that company is owned by Warren Buffett, who is making a lot of his money on coal. So well, he's doing it because dollars and cents make sense. India just announced two weeks ago that it is canceling 14 gigawatts of new coal power because of the free fall in solar energy. 14 gigawatts is more than, than the entire coal fleet for Great Britain, which invented coal-burning power plants. So this is what's happening around the globe. The reason we didn't, we, I said 63% of the new markets belong to us. The reason we don't have 100% is because the power of the incumbents, of coal, oil, and nuke, to block us from accessing the markets. They will not let independent power producers like my plants onto the marketplace. They do everything they can, and that's not fair. You know, I, I built a house in Mount Kisco, New York. I have solar power on the roof, state-of-the-art solar, and I have geothermal. My home is a power plant. I produce more energy than I use almost 365 days a year, when I'm away from that house, it's just a power plant. I ought to be able to sell my power to the power company the same as Con Ed does or any other generator. So that's called net metering, and they have it in 42 states in one form or the other, but it never actually pays you fairly. They'll pay, if energy produces that power, they'll pay them 13 cents a kilowatt hour. They'll only pay me seven at the end of each month they erase all my savings and start over again. That's not fair. We ought to have a market in this country, a fair market, market that does what a market is supposed to do, 
which is to reward good behavior, which is efficiency, and punish bad behavior, which is inefficiency and waste. And said, we ought to have a market that, that allows every American, turns every American into an energy entrepreneur, every home into a power plant, and allows us to power this country on human ingenuity, what Franklin Roosevelt called America's industrial genius, rather than back in crude and Alberta tar sands and Appalachian coal. We ought to have a marketplace. Instead, we have a marketplace that is governed by rules that were written by the incumbents to reward the dirtiest, filthiest, most poisonous, most toxic, most warmongering fuels from hell, rather than the cheap, clean, green, wholesome, and patriotic fuels from heaven. <laughs> Thank you. With, with a few minutes to spare, very efficient. Uh, Mr. Epstein, you're up. <laughs> All right. Um, so I want to share with you a position tonight that is, is definitely not a position I ever expected to have when I was growing up. And that is the position that if we want more people in the world to have long, healthy, opportunity-filled lives, we need to continue our massive use of fossil fuels, and we actually need to expand it as a world. So you're definitely going to get a different opinion than you, uh, than you just heard. Now again, this is an opinion I never expected to have. Sometimes when people hear that, oh, you're, you're really enthusiastic about fossil fuels, they think, oh, the industry must have paid you to do it, or maybe you grew up in Kentucky or something like that. So I didn't even know anyone in the fossil fuel industry when I came up with my ideas. And I grew up in a place called Chevy Chase, Maryland, which is a super uh, liberal place. And the only thing I ever heard growing up about fossil fuels is that their CO2 emissions are causing global warming, which was a concern to me and which I still agree with to a certain um, extent. But I was never really interested in energy. My, my biggest interest in life was and still is philosophy, which many people consider the least practical subject in the world, and I consider the most practical subject. Because philosophy is really about clear thinking methods. And I think that so much of this debate tonight is going to be about what is the proper method for thinking through this issue, and which person up on this stage is actually thinking about this issue um, clearly. So one key idea in philosophy is that whenever you're making a big decision in life, you need to look at the full impact of the decision. So that means you need to look at both the positive impacts and the negative impacts. And when you're considering a radical change to our way of life, uh, you really need to make sure that you're considering the positives and the negatives. So for example, you know, there are certain people who have a hostility toward uh, vaccines and say that vaccines should be significantly restricted. And they say, well, look at all these side effects we're going to protect ourselves against if we restrict vaccines. And I would say, OK, that's legitimate to do as long as you're precise about the side effects and you don't exaggerate or distort them. But you also need to look at what are the benefits that you would lose by restricting vaccines. And I believe the same thing is true with fossil fuels. If we're considering dramatic restrictions of fossil fuels, um, and I believe this is something that Robert does advocate. He's publicly supported the Green New Deal. He's publicly supported Extinction Rebellion, which is basically like, let's instantly get off fossil fuels. So we're talking about at least a radical and rapid change. So I think we need to look at, OK, what are the side effects that we're going to be avoiding, particularly climate related? That's important. But we also need to look at what are the benefits that we might be losing. And you know, for most of my life, before I started studying energy, I didn't really think that there were any benefits that we would um, be losing. Because I thought, well, you know, like fossil fuels are pretty much interchangeable with other things. Or you know, we can use this clean, green, patriotic energy that we've heard so much about. You know, why are we still using these antiquated um, technologies? But when I started studying the issue, there were two things that I realized that, that really changed my perspective, both about how important the benefits of fossil fuels are and also how difficult to replace uh, or substitute that they are. And so the first realization is that low cost, reliable energy is far more important to the amazing way of life that we have and that billions of people aspire to than I realize. So low cost, reliable energy is far more important to the amazing way of life that billions of us have and that billions of people aspire to than 
I realized. And then the second one is that low cost reliable energy is far more difficult to produce than I realized. So I want to start out with um, low cost reliable energy is really fundamental or indispensable to the amazing lives that we enjoy. And I really want to stress amazing lives that we enjoy because you've been hearing about all the problems with the world and all of these bad things. And there are certainly problems in the world, but I think realization number one that we have to have is that we are unbelievably lucky to be alive right now. This is the greatest time to ever be a human being. If you look at a chart of what life expectancy was like throughout human history, it looks like a huge hockey stick. Thousands of years people are living below 30, and then 200 years ago it starts shooting up dramatically. So you know, average person can live to around 70 now. If you look at income, which is really close to how much opportunity do you have, that again is flat for so much of history and then goes way up. And so we live in a world that just has so much, for billions of people, for certain people at least, has so much in terms of life expectancy and health and opportunity. So it's really important to recognize what is making that possible and make sure we don't make decisions that make it worse. And we also need to see how do you, how do you extend that to more people. And I never thought about energy as particularly important. I just thought, well, energy is just one thing among many. But then somebody pointed out to me, well, no, energy is, is different. It's more significant than you think. Because the reason that we're so prosperous and have so much opportunity is that we've gone from being a manual labor civilization to a machine labor civilization. And what is energy? Energy is machine calories, machine food. So energy is what allows us to use machines to improve our lives. The lower cost energy is, the lower cost everything is. The higher cost energy is, the higher cost everything is. And that includes having a good environment. People often think, oh, the environment is great, and then all we've done is ruin it with you know, all this toxic stuff. We live in the cleanest environment than anyone's ever lived in history in terms of sanitation, clean water. We have quite clean air throughout most of the United States. And a huge part of it is because we use energy, low cost energy and machines to take the environment, which is naturally dirty and dangerous in many ways, and make it far cleaner and safer than it would otherwise um, be. So low cost reliable energy, though. It has to be low cost and reliable, because if it's not low cost and reliable, then many people cannot afford it and take advantage of it. And here we run into a real issue. Three billion people in the world lack low cost reliable energy. You almost never hear about this, which is interesting, because it's, it's a fundamental tragedy. You have over a billion people in the world who have no electricity. You think about that. No electricity, so that's you know, no refrigerators, no modern hospitals, no lights to study with. And we rarely talk about that. Almost 3 billion people in the world, their source of energy for heating and cooking is wood or animal dung, which has all kinds of toxic indoor air pollution. And yet, we don't talk about this. So realizing how fundamental energy is to the amazing way of life that we enjoy, including the amazing environment we enjoy, and also that billions of people aspire to made me really interested in, OK, how do we preserve and expand what we have in terms of low cost reliable energy? And also, how do you expand that to as many people um, as possible? So that was the first realization. Now, you might say, well, and Robert would say, well, like, what does that have to do with fossil fuels? And that's what I thought as well. Like, well, do we really need fossil fuels to do this? And this, relates, this then connects to realization two, which is that low cost reliable energy is far more difficult to produce than I, than I thought. And I want to share it with you three facts that changed my perspective on our energy choices. And I want to differentiate the kind of facts that I'm going to share tonight with the kind of alleged facts that Robert shared in the sense of what I'm going to try to share with you are validated big picture empirical facts that tell you the overall picture of what's happening or that's different than, oh, I read something in Bloomberg last night that said this, or this study said this. I want to show you the big picture of what's happening with energy and what's happening. We'll talk about climate um, as well. And if you're interested in the sources on this, you can just go to fossilfueldebate.com, and I have all the documentation of everything you can see from nonpartisan sources. OK, so fact number one is that over the last 200 years, entrepreneurs have tried to produce low-cost, reliable energy using many different fuels, including sun, wind, water, waves, tides, geothermal heat, wood, crops, uranium, thorium, and of course, oil, coal, and gas, the three so-called fossil fuels. 
So these have been around, there are lots, lots of forms of energy been ar that have been around for a long amount of time. And interestingly, we've heard for many decades that many of them are going to be the energy of the future. So interestingly, Robert mentioned Amory Lovins and how Amory Lovins just told him something really new and important about energy. Well, here's what Amory Lovins says. Recent research suggests that a largely or wholly solar economy can be constructed in the United States with straightforward soft technologies that are now demonstrated and now economic or nearly economic. So that sounds plausible, right? Except that was in 1976. Amory Levin was saying, yeah, we don't need fossil fuels. We can do away with fossil fuels. He actually said, let's do away with most electricity because who needs electricity? And guess what? Like the internet needed electricity. A lot of things needed electricity. So People have a history of claiming, oh, all sorts of different forms of energy are going to work. But what is the actual reality? This leads us to fact two. So despite the existence of many forms of energy production, fossil fuels are the energy of choice over 80% of the time and are also the world's fastest growing energy source. So they're the energy of choice over 80% of the time. They're also the world's fastest growing energy source. Now, how do we reconcile that with what Robert said about solar and wind being the fastest growing energy source? And here I want to highlight a key aspect of looking at the full impact of our decisions, which is that we need to use precision and that we cannot use sloppiness. So there is, in the realm of energy, just a huge amount of distortion and sloppiness about the truth. And one of them involves the word capacity. So capacity is used to mean how much energy could a power plant produce if it worked to, to its full potential 100% of the time. So for a nuclear plant, that's a pretty, you know, it'll be at 90% capacity. So if you hear the nuclear plant has 100 megawatts of capacity, okay, that basically means 100 megawatts. But for solar and wind, they operate at 30% of capacity because they're dealing with unreliable fuels. So if you're equating something that operates at 30% with something that operates at 90%, that is a distortion. So either you're not aware of that or you're misleading people. But I would not, I wish, we should not allow this kind of sloppiness um, and, and misrepresentation. So what is going on? Why are fossil fuels um, so dominant? Now, I should say that in terms of promising forms of energy, there have also been two prominent forms of energy that have shown some significant potential. And one is hydroelectric energy, which is great in terms of low cost, reliable electricity. So it's good for electricity. It's not good for heavy duty transportation fuel, which is what we need for agriculture and for shipping and for so many of the things that make our economy work. But most of all, we need it for food because uh, agriculture requires heavy duty transportation energy. But nevertheless, hydro is good. It's limited by the number of hydro locations in the world. Interestingly, who are the biggest opponents of hydro? Not the big bad fossil fuel industry or the big bad, uh, small bad, I guess, Alex Epstein. It is the modern environmental movement, including Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is a major opponent of hydroelectric energy. It was interesting why, how low cost reliable energy from those sources that's carbon free or very low <laughs> carbon is opposed by the people who claim to be concerned about carbon. The most promising alternative to fossil fuels in the last 50 years has been nuclear power, because nuclear power, you can build it anywhere. It doesn't do much, doesn't do heavy duty transportation except for like air aircraft carriers and, and submarines. But nevertheless, it's shown amazing potential to actually, in reality, give low cost, reliable energy to a lot of people. And it was really growing in this country and doing some pretty amazing things until guess what happened? It was demonized and criminalized by the modern environmental movement, the same people who claim to care about CO2 emissions. So places like France are getting 70% of their electricity from nuclear and at, say, half the price of Germany, which is getting 5% of its total energy from solar and wind, but has still doubled its electricity prices because of that. And yet there is this bias against nuclear. So this will be an interesting thing to talk about. Why is the modern environmental movement that claims to be so concerned about CO2, why are they so hostile in particular to um, nuclear? Now, why are, this raises the question, though, why, why are fossil fuels so dominant? And I think the key is it's actually really hard to produce low-cost, reliable energy for all the different things we need it for, for billions of people around the world. And the reason is because energy is a process. To use energy, we have to take some form of raw energy like the sun or the wind or coal or oil. We need to go through a whole set of steps to get it to an end user to, say, run a harvester. Now, why do solar and wind have so much difficulty? This leads me to fact three, which is that solar and wind depend on backup from reliable fuels. And the more they are used, the more expensive energy is. 
So if you look at, um, and this will be on fossilfueldebate.com so you can see the specific data, but there's a very strong correlation between the percentage of solar and wind that countries use, um, which is almost always mandated by, by the way, and their electricity prices. So it's like the, the higher percentage of solar and wind they're using, the more their electricity prices go up. Now, why is this? You hear all these stats like, oh, solar panels are going down in price, but you have to look at the whole process to produce it. And the, the, the lie behind all these claims about solar is they're just taking one part of the process, the solar panel, and they say, oh, the solar panel is cheap, therefore the whole process is cheap. That's not honest. You have to look at the whole process. And what happens is because solar and wind are unreliable fuels, you need a process that turns unreliable fuels into reliable energy. What that means in practice, because batteries are so expensive and they're all built by fossil fuels, by the way, is that you need 100% backup from reliable fuels, which is usually coal, gas, or nuclear. Well, because the unreliable fuels can go to almost zero at any given time, you need 100% backup from a reliable fuel energy system. Well, guess what? If you need to pay for the reliable, 100% reliable energy infrastructure and unreliable in energy infrastructure, which is going to be cheaper? To just have the reliable energy infrastructure or to add on this whole other unreliable energy infrastructure? Obviously more expensive with the unreliable energy infrastructure. So this is what happens in practice. Uh, so there's all these accounting gimmicks, but the, the truth is in the more you use it, the more energy costs, and also it is dependent on the reliable fuels. So I am the biggest enthusiast of competition and innovation, and that's why I'm so enthusiastic about, say, pursuing nuclear and pursuing other forms of energy, but it's very wrong to favor only one form of energy, these so-called renewables, or really the unreliable renewables, because most of the environmental movements against hydro, like that is a really irrational policy. That's not a pro-market policy. That's an anti, well, this is really an anti-energy policy. So the conclusion is we want to, nuclear has a lot of potential. It's been held back decades. Given the current state of energy and the current need for energy, um, the quality of life in the wealthy world and the poor world in the next several decades requires continued massive fossil fuel use. I mean, if, you, if we want to continue our way of life and also expand that to billions more people, there's just nobody has close to the ability to provide that energy uh, for that many people. We should get started on alternatives, again, by stopping the demonization and criminalization of nuclear, and we should allow solar and wind to compete without a whole bunch of special privileges that they have, um, but fossil fuels are going to be really, really crucial. And if we have significant radical uh, restriction, I know Robert said he only read the debate title uh, today, I'm not sure whose responsibility that is, but he does advocate, and, and more importantly, our culture advocates radical restrictions on fossil fuels. You see in, in Colorado, you're talking about going fossil free. The Green New Deal is talking about 100% renewable. That means fossil fuel use is outlawed. It's not saying, oh, we have a lot of optimism because Robert F. Kennedy is bankrolling some really effective companies and they have a lot of promise. That would be terrific. It's that we, by X year, we are not allowed to use fossil fuels. And that is really, really catastrophic. So, if we radically restrict fossil fuels, we, we, lose on, we lose basically the modern way of life for billions of people. Now there's a question, what about the side effects? And that's what I want to talk about now. Is it, it might be worth it. Maybe climate is such a bad thing that we need to take a huge hit to our standard of living. But make no mistake, reducing fossil fuel use dramatically means a big hit to our standard of living. So when we're talking about climate, it's crucial to be precise. And so there's a difference between believing that we cause some warming, which is what I believe, and that we cause runaway catastrophic warming. And so I want to give you three other facts that changed my perspective, again, available at fossilfueldebate.com. So fact number one is that environmental thought leaders have been predicting imminent climate doom for 30 plus years. So when you hear, oh my gosh, the world is going to end, we have 12 years left, well it turns out that those claims have been made for 30 to 50 years. So just to give you one example, President Obama's leading science advisor John Holdren said in the mid-1980s it's possible that carbon dioxide climate-induced famines could kill as many as a billion people before the year 2020. Or 1989, 1989, the UN said that entire nations could be wiped off the face of the earth by rising sea levels if the global warming trend is not reversed by the year 2000. So clearly these apocalyptic scenarios didn't happen, but you might think, well, it's getting really bad. 
right? We can't ignore that. Well, this leads to fact number two, which is that human beings are safer from climate today than we've ever been. And nobody believes this, but there's actually a data point which I've brought up in my book, and I've brought it up in debates, and no green movement person has ever been able to answer this, because it's from the International Disaster Database. And what it does is track how many people are actually dying from storms and flood and heat and cold. Not an anecdote about, oh, a neighbor of mine died, and so it's getting worse. No, how many people are dying? And what actually happened is in the 1930s, you had millions of people a year in many of those years dying. 10 million a year adjusted for population. When my book came out, it was 30, in 2014, it was 30,000 climate-related deaths. So there's a huge decrease. And then people think, oh, it must have gotten worse. So last year, there were 5,625 total climate-related deaths. Now, how is this possible? There are two basic reasons. One is that the people who are predicting doom, they ignore the fact that low-cost, reliable energy from fossil fuels and the industrial civilization they power protects us from climate dramatically. Climate is not naturally safe, and we make it dangerous. It's naturally dangerous, and we make it safe. So what we've done is we've made our climate far safer by having this amazing fossil fueled civilization. The other thing, though, is that not only did they ignore the huge climate protection benefits of fossil fuels, they dramatically exaggerated and distorted the side effects, just like people do with vaccines. So this leads to fact number three, which is that while prominent models and thought leaders have predicted runaway warming and rapid sea level rises, we have experienced warming of only two degrees Fahrenheit in the last 150 years with sea level rises that are very slow compared to our ancestors. So it's not that we haven't caused any, it's not, I'm not saying we haven't caused any warming, I'm saying we've caused some warming, but the people who are, who are publicizing it, at least, are you telling me I'm out of time? I have one more minute. No, no, I, I timed it exactly. It says 19 <laughs> minutes. Uh, and I wanted to make sure I didn't get screwed. <laughs> okay, and so I get that 17 seconds back to it. So I got, I got one more minute according to my clock. Okay, so what's actually happening is, in the world is, yes, we're having an influence, but that influence is far milder and more manageable. So what we're having is a very manageable side effect with an amazing benefit. So the conclusion is that fossil fuels are making our lives amazing, and that they can make our lives even more amazing, and that the way to make our lives most amazing is to have energy freedom, including stop the demonization and criminalization of nuclear, by the green movement, allow all forms of energy to compete, and allow billions of people to have prosperity um, by using the best energy sources uh, for their lives. So I believe that is the path forward for the future, and I look forward to diving into some of the specifics, and I think you'll see um, where the truth is. Thank you. And uh, the gentleman yields back the remaining 3.72 seconds of his time as call, he was calculating. Um, so I want to start, before we get into some of the significant substance uh, that we just heard about and some of those disagreements, uh, I did some of my throat clearing myself earlier about my own um, vantage point on some of this, my own job. Um, there, there are elephants in the room. So. As we prepared for this event, I went online to read some of the comments about this event before it happened. It's always an uplifting and edifying experience <laughs> reading online comments. Uh, and there were some themes that came up from time to time. And I thought it's important um, to at least address them and acknowledge them out of the gate. And then we can move to substance. Um, so for Mr. Epstein, there were a lot of people who were going along the lines of saying, you really shouldn't have a platform on an issue this serious because you are a science denier, right? So Rolling Stone listed you among the climate change denier elite a number of years ago. Um, you've been quoted praising the oil industry as producing the lifeblood of civilization. I think you agree with that, but I think a lot of people blanch at that type of framing. Um, your critics, as I said, call you a science denier, say that you have personally profited from or gotten money from or been funded by big oil, big coal, Koch brothers. Uh, they note that you cheered the since ousted EPA administrator Scott Pruitt as heroic um, early on in the Trump administration. So when you hear people try to disqualify you, because that's a lot of what our, and this is for both sides, a lot of our political debates these days are trying to disqualify the other person out of the gate 
so we don't really get into the substance. It's sort of part of cancel culture and the deplatforming movement. When people say to you that you, it's problematic that you have a personal financial stake in undermining science or undermining sound public policy, what's your response to those critiques? Yeah, so I think that th there are two important issues here criticisms here. So one is the science denier criticism and the other is the, the shill criticism. And they're somewhat related, but I think they're different. So the, the science denier position is just somebody is saying your position is somehow anti-science. And so I, I tried to explain that earlier in terms of, no, my position is very pro. Look at the science as precisely as possible and integrate it so that we understand the full impact of different choices. So like, you know, just as like if you're looking at vaccines, you need to look at the science about the side effects and the science about the benefits. So with fossil fuels, you need to look very precisely at the science about the side effects, the science about the benefits. And that includes things like not exaggerating, not distorting things, not like that capacity fallacy, not equating mild warming with catastrophic warming, not saying 97% of scientists agree with catastrophic warming when they only agreed with mild warming. Like these kinds of things are really important. So I regard myself as a, as a, as a science lover and somebody who really respects science and its, its proper role. Um, in terms of the, um, the funding thing, I should say that although I don't get funding from the industry, I think that, that people involved in the industry should speak up a lot more. People you know, being funded from the industry, what does that mean? I mean, that just means that they're producing energy and we're buying it. And I think we should absolutely pe hear from those people. And I wish we would hear more from them. My own background, as I said, is I came to this issue um, from totally outside the industry. I didn't even know anyone in the industry. Uh, but what I did do is I, had a, I, I wanted to build a business in terms of promoting my ideas. And so I decided the way to do it was I wanted f full independence, as much independence as I could get. So I, I, I didn't do the conventional nonprofit where you raise money from different people and they have some kind of influence. I decided to do a for-profit business where basically I charge people for my ideas. So like I'll come to a place like this and say, well, you know, you can pay me for my ideas. And the thing that I do with different industries, but particularly, uh, mostly the fossil fuel industry, as I say, in cases where I agree with you on policy, if you pay me, I'll help you get better messaging. But my goal is for, to help them use my ideas uh, effectively. So it's the opposite of they're paying me to say what they think. No, they're paying me to tell them uh, what they should say. And that's something I'm, I'm really proud of. And I think if you, if you grasp the arguments that I've made today and the evidence that I've given, I think the fossil fuel industry is an amazing benefactor of human life. Certainly, there are plenty of mistakes and plenty of individual bad people. But of course, I'm proud to be associated with the industry. And I would be proud to be funded by them in the conventional sense. I just happen. Uh, not to be. Okay, and Mr. Kennedy, uh, you frequently appeal to the authority of science, as we heard in your initial presentation, and yet, quite controversially, as Alex has alluded to a few times, you've engaged in what critics call anti-vax conspiracies. Those critics include several prominent members of your own family, who publicly condemned you on this subject in May, calling you, quote, tragically wrong in a, political, a Politico op-ed which also accused you of helping to, quote, spread dangerous misinformation over social media and being, quote, complicit in sowing distrust of the science behind vaccines. Others note that you have a large personal carbon footprint relative to most people on the planet. What's your response when people suggest that your commitment to science is perhaps selective and that your lifestyle could be hypocritical? Well, let me first answer the question that you asked him about whether people should be able to censor him because uh, Alex, because they don't like what he says. I'm offended by that. I think any American should be offended by it. You know, I don't agree with him, but he has a right to make his argument, and we ought to be able to process those arguments in the market of debate and the and you know it's any American it's any democratic democracies don't work unless you have free flow of information I don't agree with a lot of the things that have been happening on the campuses where people are um, you know are shutting down speakers because they're controversial he has a right to, to make his point and I would defend that right till you know to the end because that's what we do in this country. I want to I want to take maybe my time, but the, the maybe the time the two minutes that I had left over <laughs> to address some oh. of the things hey, that, the next one? <laughs> some of the things that were said about me by Alex and also 
the challenge he put up about and nobody has been able to answer the question on his graph about why human why why, why um, carbon has gone up at this in lockstep with a decline in carbon in climate deaths the answer is and here's you can no longer say nobody gave you the answer the answer is because the two things have nothing to do with each other it's called correlation not causation a reason climate deaths have gone down is because we're better at forecasting we're better at uh, disaster relief. We have radios. We have televisions. Uh, we, you know, my, I had friends who were in Grand Bahamas. They survived because they knew what was happening and what was coming, and that's why climate deaths. If you really want to know the answer to that question about whether there is a relationship between use of carbon and um, I and the injury or disasters, you need to look at property damage, and you'll see it's gone sky high and locks up with carbon. I, are you going to ask about Nuke later? Because he yes. made a, okay, so I won't do that. But I also just want to respond to one other thing he said. 1.3 billion people in this world who don't have energy, and they're not going to get it unless we do it with carbon. That's exactly the opposite of true. Those are people who were left behind by the carbon economy. These are the people that I deal with in my work. They're people in remote areas who will never get carbon because you can't build a pipeline to them. Nobody's going to do it. You can, but you can build a road, uh, and then you can give them a, a, an oil, or bo oil boiler, and you have to ship oil to them. And nobody's going to do it because they have no money. The solution for them is solar panels and distributed power. It's not carbon. It would be a terrible, terrible investment for us to invest in carbon. Now, I'll talk about vaccines. And by the way, I agree to this debate. I would love it if somebody would debate me on the subject of vaccines. And since it's a great, it seems to be a great interest of yours, I challenge you to make that, to debate me on it. And I'm going to tell you just what my position is. And my position is not any science. My position is exactly aligned with the National Academy of Science and the Institute of Medicine. People don't know my position because people call me an anti-vaxxer, but I'm not. I'm pro-vaccine. I had all my children vaccinated. I believe the vaccine should be tested, safety tested. People don't know. You cannot sue a company that, that makes vaccines that injures you. No matter how egregious the injury is, no matter how negligent that company was, no matter how toxic the ingredient. Furthermore, they're completely insulated, so there's no incentive for them to make vaccines safe. Furthermore, they're also exempt. They're the only medicine that's exempt from safety testing. So now, one of the 72 vaccines currently given to our children, mandated, has ever been tested against a placebo. That means nobody knows what the risk profile is, and nobody can say with a scientific certainty that that vaccine is averting more problems than it causes. And I don't think that we ought to be mandating medical interventions for unwilling Americans unless we know precisely that that vaccine is going to end up hating, helping people rather than hurting them. The Institute of Medicine is the ultimate arbiter of vaccine science, according to Congress and HHS. And the Institute of Medicine has time and again in 1991, 1994, 2011, 2014, has scolded and rebuked and screamed at the CDC for not doing safety testing on any of these vaccines. And we've seen vaccine schedule. I had three vaccines when I was a kid. My children got 72. It changed in 89, and if you were born prior to 89, your chance of having a chronic disease, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, autism, food allergies, is 12%. If you were born after 89, it is 54%, according to HHS. And nobody's explaining where is it all coming from? Where is all the autism coming from if it's not vaccines? Why is it in my generation, one in 2,500 kids had autism, and in this generation, one in 34? CDC is supposed to tell us where the diseases are coming from. 
I said, in my generation, one in 400 kids had food allergies, peanut allergies, and one in 10 t today. And guess what? Look at the vaccine inserts. All yes, of the 400 diseases that are now epidemic in our children. All right. All right. So we're, we're a bit over time. It could, could be. I didn't want to have this conversation, but I'm not going to shy away from it. OK. Um, so we've, we've, had our, we've had our say on, on those two issues, or most of those two issues. Um, let's move on to my next question. Uh, it seems clear, based on both of your passion, that you are concerned about the well-being of all people on this planet, and particularly the world's indigent populations. Uh, Mr. Epstein has argued that a premature curtailing of fossil fuels will prevent sorely needed economic development and could have a regressive effect on the poor. Mr. Kennedy has argued that climate change could have a disproportionately devastating effect on the poor. So you both want to help people. You both want to make sure that uh, vulnerable populations are safe and able to flourish. Can you each discuss why you believe the risk balance tips in the direction of your worldview on this? And perhaps as sort of a, a corollary, is there evidence that you would need to see in order to convince you that you were wrong about which side has the better, uh, the better case? And we'll start with Mr. Epstein. Um, just, sorry, I don't want to keep going to this, but the vaccine thing, so the, I want to just make clear on my position on the vaccines. No, no, no. My position is it's a model that I did not say anything about Robert's specific view of vaccines. I'm interested um, in his, his view, but it's not an expertise. I'm bringing up vaccines as a model of we need to look at the full impact of things with precision. So he's claiming to be doing that. I have suspicions about that. I'm certain he's not doing it with energy, but I'm just, that was a model. It's Let's not to say it, I don't have Alex. Let's debate. debate it. Agree to debate No, me. because I don't have specific knowledge about well, then vaccines. Well, stop attacking me. I was not attacking no, I just said I'm attacking you for Let's distorting have a energy. On it or not to, no, we're having a debate on energy, which you are distorting, as I've demonstrated and will continue to demonstrate. Okay. So let's go to... Thank you, audience advisor. Um, okay. So let's... let's, let's Okay, I'll get, give you a check from Big Oil, my best friend. Okay, so let's let's talk about um, why is it that I think that um, that the freedom, and I want to stress, the freedom to continue using fossil fuels is essential. So I'm not there's I'm not saying we need to have a law that prevents certain people in certain places from having solar panels. I'm all for that. I don't want that to be um, to be forced on people. And so why do I think? that it's so important for people to be able to use fossil fuels. Well, basically, my entire opening, that energy, that low-cost, reliable energy is indispensable for people to have the ability uh, to flourish. So that's point one. And point two is the fossil, you know, fossil fuels are a unique source of this in terms of that can provide low-cost, reliable energy for all of our different uses, including heavy-duty transportation, on a scale of, of billions of people. And I think... The history here is really instructive because what I find in a lot of these debates is you hear a lot of people making claims about the future. And it's really, the track record is really important. And the track record that for decades people have been saying, oh yeah, renewables can easily replace fossil fuels. And particularly saying we're going to have mass death and devastation from climate. And then the fact that actually fossil fuels were by far the most effective way to get a lot of energy for a lot of people, and that that devastation hasn't happened in part because people empowered by fossil fuels protected themselves more against climate, that's very, very relevant. And so if you look at just, let's look at just China and India, like a combined almost 2.5 billion people where you've had quintupling or more of fossil fuel use in the last 40 years and life expectancy increases of at least seven years. So you think about two and a half billion people have industrialized using fossil fuels and extended their lives by at least seven years. That is really fundamental. Whereas, and as I said, like climate, in terms of its actual impact on human life, the, the claims about disaster damages, um, those are wrong. We'll put those on fossilfueldebate.com and also we'll do a, a podcast on Wednesday, like going into the sources on all this stuff. But if you look up Roger Pilkey Jr., I believe is affiliated with this. He's kind of the expert on actual climate damages. So you can look at that. But in terms of climate related deaths, remember it was forecast that millions of people would be dying 
and yet it's not happening because we're building a durable civilization. So I think it's clear that the benefit to poor people is huge, and there's no reason to think that poor people around the world can't do what China and India did, and actually with modern technology and best practices do it a lot more uh, cleanly. So I think it's just totally clear that the freedom to use fossil fuels is essential, and that, res that taking away that freedom is really, I mean, I regard it as energy genocide. Your response to that? Uh, here, uh, one thing is, the, Alex, you're using, uh, you're using a lot of debating tricks, um, which is, and one of them is, uh, is using the word, conflating the word energy with oil interchangeably, and it's not. I believe we should have energy. I think we should use the cheapest kind of energy. You made this statement earlier that I somehow you know, did some kind of bait and switch when I was talking about the pricing of energy, and you dismiss Bloomberg, which, I, you know, Bloomberg is a leading authority on energy. It looks at every single transaction. The costs I was giving you are levelized costs. They, that means all the fuel, all the operation and maintenance, it is the, all of the capitalization, and that's the cost. That is the only way of making a fair cost, and they're cheaper. It's one-tenth the cost of, the, of nuke. So why wouldn't we, isn't it better for poor people if we use the cheapest energy? Doesn't it mean we can get to more poor people? I want to say this. I work with poor communities. I see what happens, what we call the oil curse. If you have oil, I just came from Cancer Alley. There's a million people between Baton Rouge and New Orleans who have poisoned water. Their lives are not good. I do a lot, I've been 30 years, I've been litigating in West Virginia. When I was a little boy, my father said to me, talk to me about a mountaintop removal, it was just called strip mining, and they were just starting. He said, they're not only doing it to cheapen the, their mining, but they're, they're doing it to get rid of workers. And he told me that in 1968, there were 114,000 unionized mine workers in West Virginia. Today, there's 11,000 miners left in this state, and very few of them, probably a quarter of them, are unionized. Because, and they now, and they, you know, they're, they're mining with machines that cost a half a billion dollars, and are 22 stories high, and practically dispensed with the need for human labor. And West Virginia, is the richest state in this country. If you look at the coal beneath the ground, if you look at the people, it's the poorest. It has the worst education system. It has the worst health care. It has the worst of everything. The water is poison, the air is poison, and the people are demoralized and beaten, and that is the legacy of carbon. So I feel like, obviously, there's disagreements about some of the measuring sticks here and what is cheaper uh, and what's more affordable and what isn't. One of the key questions in this debate is what should be done about it from the level of the U.S. federal government, right, and, and the, the jurisdiction that we have, the sovereignty that we have. And you, you get these generally kind of superficial arguments about government intervention versus the free market, and I guess my question is, what is the proper role for the federal government on this issue versus the role of private industry? So one argument, uh, Mr. Epstein, would be, if climate change is an existential crisis, which is something that many people believe, whether you dispute it or not, many people, especially younger people, believe that, right? Mm -hmm. And so if people in their core believe that to be true, wouldn't that justify a dramatic governmental intervention of some sort. And um, that's point one. And point two, what in your mind is appropriate for the government to do in this overall realm? You mean with the doomsday scenario or not in the second part? So you're saying assume doomsday. So, so I guess, then, so if people do? believe it's doomsday, yeah. right, would that justify massive government intervention? And then based on what you think is actually happening, what should the government do and not do? Yeah, I mean, so, but I think it's, I mean, you can do this hypothetical, like, if it's doomsday, but the main thing is people need to understand what actually drives uh, a hot, like, human, what I call human flourishing, so long, healthy, opportunity-filled lives. I think the, the core reason people 
think there's doomsday is because they have the view that basically the planet is perfect in its natural state, and then we're, anytime we impact it, there's this delicate balance, and we're going to upset the balance, and it's going to go haywire. And I think it's really important that that's not how the planet works at all. The planet is wild potential. It is not, you know, it's not stable. It's not, it doesn't give us sufficient stuff for our needs. We need to transform it. It's not safe. So we need to dramatically impact the planet um, to meet our needs and to provide for a lot of people. And so that takes energy and you want to use the lowest cost, most reliable energy. And most of the time when people are in reality, um, that's fossil fuels for people. So it, this is really important because if you're talking about doomsday, you need to realize that the, the, the thing that makes our amazing lives possible, and I keep wanting to stress we have unprecedented amazing lives, is this low cost, reliable energy. If you just take out that, what, that one variable, with all the knowledge and all the technology we have, if you don't have low cost, reliable energy powering your machines, nothing works. You can have all the knowledge in the world, all the technology. If those machines don't have calories, um, nothing works. So we should be afraid of doomsday from energy restrictions. That's why I call it energy genocide, from these prohibitions that will deprive people of the energy that they need to live and thrive, let alone deprive uh, people of new opportunities. So it's really important that it's crazy that people see, oh, two degrees Fahrenheit warming in 150 years. Oh my gosh, the world is going to end. And people talk about policies that will cause blackouts and worse and are already starting to cause blackouts and are already starting, by the way, in Europe to cause people to die from hypothermia in greater numbers because their energy is more expensive. Like, the actual world being good depends on low-cost, reliable energy. It does not depend on specific climate conditions. If we have low-cost, reliable energy, we can deal with any climate conditions almost. If we don't, we can deal with no climate conditions. Now, if if there was something like an incredibly rapid rise in sea level um, and you, in something really dramatic that was really existential, yes, the government would, should do something about it. And, but the pro-human way would be to really look at what is demonstrated to work and what's most effective. And the thing you would do, I mean, the thing you would obviously do given the actual record of nuclear in terms of how much energy costs or electricity costs nuclear is you would, I mean, the first thing you do is try to build up the whole world with nuclear power plants. That would be the obvious thing that you would do um, if you cared. You wouldn't keep making promises about these unreliable fuels uh, being able to transform everything, even though in reality they always add cost, because again, for the obvious reason that you always have to add the unreliable energy infrastructure to the reliable energy um, infrastructure. So I don't know, if I'm out of time and I want to respect time, but. You really need to realize low cost, reliable energy, that's the thing you should be afraid of losing. You should not be afraid of fairly modest changes in climate conditions. The temperature of this planet used to be 25 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it is today. CO2 levels used to be at least 10 times higher. We're not in some unprecedented territory for the planet, but we have an unprecedented, unprecedented good life because we have an amazing ability to produce energy using fossil fuels. And I hope that people outcompete it but to prohibit it is energy genocide. So on the competition. Well, let, me, let, me ask, let me ask a question. Uh, I, I, let me put a pin right here that everything Alex said that I understood, I disagree with. But then I'm going to, I want to answer the question, which is what should government be doing? I don't believe, as Alex trying to put words in my mouth, that I want to outlaw fossil fuels. No, I want to create markets. That's the American ideal. We ought, to do, we ought to create fair markets where every American can participate. And you know, we did this with the internet. 1979, we passed the bill that created the ARPANET. The federal government built the infrastructure for a marketplace. In 1980, a year later, the CEO of IBM said that personal computers are a dead-end technology, and they got out of the business. 1980. Well, what happened? Because we had a marketplace, everybody got a personal computer, and what happened to the cost of information, of bits and bytes? It plummeted to zero. If I want to know what Mao Zedong's favorite lunchtime meal is, I can look it up on Google. You know how much that information would have cost you before they did that? You would have had to go to the Library of Congress and spend a week in the stacks. And, but today, it's free information forever because we created the market. 1996, we passed the Telecommunications Act. 
We, and Bill Clinton said all the baby bells have to unify. Everybody gets on the lowest cost providers prevail in the marketplace. That's why we all have cell phones in our pockets. I can do all this stuff. And, and what happened to phone calls? When I started working at Pace, there was only one phone call in the campus where you were allowed to make overseas calls. It cost $75 to call London. People don't, kids don't believe this. It's free phone calls forever because we built a market. That's what's going to happen if we build a market for energy, a real market and not one where the incumbents can block access to people like me. We, because you know what? They have, their, their coal is, how, what is that? Five minutes or two minutes yes. or what? Two minutes. Two minutes. It, their coal costs money. Their, it costs today about a billion dollars a gigawatt to build a solar plant. It costs five billion to build a coal plant, but then you gotta pay for the coal. You gotta cut down the Appalachian, shut them across the country, earn the coal, poison every fish with mercury, kill 18,000 people a year with ozone and particulates, sterilize all the lakes in the Adirondacks, and do all these other bad things. The, the photons are hitting the Earth every day for free. All we have to do is build the infrastructure to allow people to harvest them and then to sell them back on the grid. And you know what's going to happen? We're going to have free energy forever. And we have the best solar energy in the world in this country. The Scientific American said if we put solar panels on an area 75 miles by 75 miles in the desert southwest, we produce three times the amount of energy that for the entire North American grid. We have more wind. We, we're the Saudi Arabia of wind. We have enough wind in Montana, harnessable wind, Texas, North Dakota, to power the entire American grid. So all we need to do is build the marketplace and then we get free energy forever because there's no fuel costs. And what happens? Then it releases the energy of our country. It's like a permanent tax break for every business and every American. And it democratizes the grid so, other than concentrating that power and making a few billionaires and impoverishing the rest of us. So I, I think the idea of creating the marketplace and allowing true competition, that, that speaks my language, right? That's something that's very compelling to me. I guess part of the question is, when you look at policy proposals like the Green New Deal, for example, we didn't get this amazing explosion of cell phone technology, you know, cellular technology, by outlawing pay phones, right? We didn't outlaw typewriters to have computers uh, advance massively. Right. Green New I, Deal. And I disagree with that approach. I think we ought to have markets. So you think the Green New Deal? You don't support I, the Green know, New Deal. You know, there's probably parts of it that I support. Putting a price on on if, if you need to discharge a pollutant like carbon, you ought to pay a price for it. And so that you know, I believe we should we need to get rid of externalities. Alex doesn't seem to know what an externality is. Because he thinks this is cheap energy. That you know, coal is 11 cents a kilowatt. It's the cheapest. You're paying for the coal roads and the mercuries and the wars and all this other stuff out of your other pocket. It's just coming out of your income tax. You're not paying it at the pump. It's coming out of you're still paying it. So let's so let's go there. So let's so cheap as I, I want to talk about you to respond to that and also I'm gonna throw in one extra question of my own, yeah. which is this. Uh, one of the words that you keep using uh, is reliable when talking about yeah. energy sources. And Robert has mentioned the major advances in solar technology. It seems to me that the sun is quite reliable. And I wonder, you know, is, that, is that something when we talk about expanding our, our capability technologically, is solar something that you think has a high ceiling to eventually replace perhaps carbon? Okay. Well, I have three minutes. These are two. Big question, I mean, are we relying on the sun right now? Like, what, what do you mean? I mean, reliable means, so. Well, it'll, it'll be back in a few hours, you know, and we right, know when so it'll be. All right, let me deal with that one quickly, since I think it's pretty straightforward, and then remind me of the other. Oh, I want to deal with the externality, response, because that's a yeah. much more uh, substantive issue. Um, so the, yeah, when I say reliable, it means reliable for your purposes. So modern life that you know, has been created mostly by fossil fuels, is we are used to and, and have built our lives around having 
low cost energy on demand so that we can use amazing machines to improve our lives at all times. Like if you want to run, run an incubator for a baby, you want to be able to do it all the time. It, you want to be able to turn the lights on any time. You want to be able to have a respirator work any time. So when you have a stored fuel, then you can rely on it for on-demand energy. When you have an intermittent flow, you can rely that it'll be, it'll be there sometimes, but it'll, it'll mostly not be there when you need it. And then there's this question of backup. And so I've discussed that, and I've discussed how that's, that's the key to why it always jacks up the price and why it's dependent and why it doesn't actually work um, uh, in practice very well in terms of so there's a question of like does it have a high ceiling I think the highest ceiling is going to be from nuclear just because nuclear is so naturally concentrated a form of energy solar is always limited because it's very dilute you need a lot of space um, to harness it but I want to talk about um, externalities in terms so and I'm glad Robert you brought this up because I forgot to uh, address what you said in your opening statement you mentioned the IMF International Monetary Fund and you mentioned that they had this, this they said, well, there are $5.2 trillion in subsidies. So it's really interesting uh, to look up what that means, because a subsidy means, and this is the kind of subsidy solar and wind gets, it means basically the government and some of the companies that you bankroll and maneuver for, like Bright Source <coughs> and stuff, like when they get subsidies, that means like the government is basically giving them money. They're like paying them money, and so ultimately we are paying extra money for the energy. And so if you look at, say, the Energy Information Administration, it will say that solar and wind get 14 times more subsidies than all forms of energy. So that, that in terms of like, that's what a real subsidy means, giving people money. Now there's this other idea that I'm going to calculate what I believe are all the negative consequences of this, and I'm not going to that people aren't paying for, but I'm not going to calculate what are called the positive externalities, all the benefits that people aren't paying for. So whenever you're doing stuff, um, there are certain benefits people are paying for, there are certain benefits they're not paying for, and there are certain harms that people aren't paying for. And what happens with these externality calculations is they only look at negatives, so it's this same kind of bias only looking at the negatives, and then they have huge free reign to make up anything they want. And a good indication is the IMF calculation, I believe in one year, it increased by $2 trillion. So one year they said, it was, I don't have the exact number, something like $3 trillion, and the next year they say $5 trillion. And so what's happening is they're just making up models that are saying, we're only going to look at the negatives, and we're going to make up all these crazy scenarios, and then we're going to blame you now. And what we're, they're saying, in effect, is, yeah, you think that this energy is low cost, um, but it's not. Actually, it's totally ruining your life. But how does that square with the fact that the more of this stuff we use, the longer and better lives we get? So what's happening is people are completely inflating and distorting the so-called negative externalities and completely ignoring and evading the positive externalities. This is what happens all the time with fossil fuels and, for that matter, with nuclear. People are ignoring the amazing benefits and they're exaggerating and distorting the side effects. So actually what is happening in the world and, and so the climate-related deaths are an indication of this. People are saying, yeah, you need to calculate ne negative externalities because there's going to be all this massive suffering and death. And then it doesn't happen because in part of all these positive externalities of fossil fuels. So the world is getting much better, which means that there are a lot more of these positive externalities than there are negative externalities. And so it's pseudoscience to say, oh, yeah, coal should. So here's an interesting question for Robert. Like, what should a gallon of gasoline cost? Because in Europe, it's something like I don't know, $10 a gallon, so it's already about twice what we pay. And yet, solar and wind have not dominated there. They haven't revolutionized there. They still use gasoline. So there's a question of basically what he's saying is not that he has a really cheap way of producing energy or that there is one on the market. He's saying, let's make fossil fuels unbelievably expensive, and then everything will be great. And no, if you make fossil fuels unbelievably expensive, everything will be unbelievably um, expensive. So no, actually, fossil fuels are low cost, and the externality argument basically means there is no, no, no real low cost energy like we're used to uh, available, so we should just make, I don't know, what should gasoline cost? So let's, let's address that. Well, positive yeah. externalities, are you ignoring yeah. a huge part of the equation? No, of course positive externalities, this is kind of a sophomoric view, of course they're measured economically, it's called profits. That's what they're selling us, and they're charging us for it. So, and you know, I, here's what I would say about gasoline. What is the true cost of gasoline? If we, and you know, if we have to go to Saudi Arabia, punch holes in the ground, bring up the oil, refine it expensively, 
I'm genuflected to the sheiks who despise democracy and are hated by their own people and don't let women drive cars and cut off American journalists' bone saws. Is that a good thing for our country? And then take that oil, bring it across the Atlantic with a military escort that, guess what? Exxon doesn't pay for, you and I do. Then spill it all over Valdez, spill it all over the Gulf, and leave us with the cleanup bill. And burn the oil, produce three uh, ozone particulates and benzene, toluene, and xylene that cost our healthcare system and respiratory and cardiac illnesses every year $365 billion. So, and then get in periodic wars, the last one we got in cost $3 trillion. That's part of the cost of oil. When, you, when the World Trade Center came down, that's part of the cost of oil, because we put our troops in Saudi Arabia to protect their oil wells. Why would we do that? Why is America doing that? Shouldn't we be making our own energy right here where we've got a huge abundance of it and taking that money and putting it in schools? <laughs> oh, we ought to have a price of gasoline. At, we ought to have a price of gasoline at the pump that reflects all that cost. We're paying for $200 million, $200 billion a year to protect the infrastructure in the Gulf of Hormuz. Why are we doing that? We're not even using that oil anymore, but it's important to our oil companies to do that because of what it does to the international price. What if we just got off of oil? And so what, what would happen if you did add all those costs of oil? Yeah, gasoline price at the pump would go up to $12.50. What would happen? We'd all be driving electric cars because the market would be sending us appropriate signals. And that's what you want. You want, if markets are going to work, if you give somebody a subsidy, it distorts the marketplace. And people don't get the appropriate signals, and they act irrationally. And if you want to maximize wealth for a nation, you have true free markets with no subsidies, and no externalities, and that's what we ought to be making the American ideal, and we ought to be spending that money, not on wars in the Gulf, but on building schools for our children and police and hospitals and making this the best country in the world and not sending all of our money and our, and our treasure over there and then bringing home our young boys in caskets. That's part of the cost of oil. And, we're and so, Alex, on that, on that point, it's a powerful argument that people hear, and we, we do have significant financial interests over there, and there are conflicts in that region, obviously, and have been for quite some time. There has been a pretty big boom here at home when it comes to natural gas, for example. Uh, what's... <laughs> it's not a political point. It's just, it's just a statement of fact, right? So, so is, there, is there a happy coming together that's possible based on the argument he's making against foreign intervention and the cost therein, negative externalities, and what we're doing here at home? Yeah, I mean, I, I thought for a second he was going to say, oh, well, yeah, let's liberate domestic oil production. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yes. uh, um, so, if it can compete, I'm all for it. Yeah, so uh, there's so many things I want to talk about. The, I want to <laughs> talk about my, like, let's talk about what, let me just say something about how energy, how, how policy should work. So, because I have a very different view of how to do it. And I want, I think the externalities way of do so basically the externalities way of doing it is that Robert or whomever Robert designates can arbitrarily say, yeah, I think first of all this idea there are no positive externalities except for profits. That's that's just nonsense. I don't know where that came from, but like okay, there's so many things to say. So just just to take a positive externality, like what's the positive externality of low cost reliable energy in the 1970s and 80s? mostly from coal, making possible the internet, which you gave a, a nice tribute to earlier. Like, nobody paid the coal companies to free up the time and to give the opportunity to create the internet, and yet the abundance of time and the availability of electricity, that led to amazing innovation. So one of the great things about low-cost reliable energy is not just that it allows you to use machines 
um, more effectively directly, but it frees up an amazing amount of time to innovate. So, so much of the innovation that we have in the world is based on low-cost, reliable energy, and we owe a huge thank you to these alleged destroyers of the Earth who freed up this amazing time and gave us these amazing lives to create something like the Internet. Now, Robert's, uh, I don't know if it's a friend, but ally, Amory Lovins, I should say again, in the 1970s was saying we can replace fossil fuels with nuclear. Oh, no, I'm sorry, he was anti-nuclear as well. Um, he said we should replace fossil fuels with renewables and efficiency. And he said we, and this is in chapter one of Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, which you read last night, I appreciate. He said we need to restrict the use of electricity. So, and this is all these negative externalities. So you can see this viewpoint just allows you these complete <coughs> fascist destructive controls where you can say, yeah, I'm going to say there are all these negative consequences and I'm going to do a study and I'm going to make a calculation and therefore I can jack up your gasoline price uh, to $12 and reassure you that there's going to be some um, amazing alternative. But there is a question of how do you deal with things that he's classifying as externalities, things like real pollution. So situations where coal is actually polluting. And I think the way to do it is you need to define rights. You need to define property rights. And the key thing you need to do is you need to define in different areas thresholds of how much emissions of X is OK and how much isn't. And one key principle of this is you cannot assume that any amount of it is dangerous. And a lot of the kinds of studies Robert is mentioning and these statistics that he's throwing around, what they're doing is they're based, it's based on what's called linear no threshold um, uh, response. What that means is that if some quantity of something is toxic, then any quantity of something is toxic. And in reality, no. Some quantity of everything is toxic, but there's always a benign level, and often there's what's called a hormetic level, which is a beneficial level. So I do believe that we need to set standards for things like pollution. And if CO2 was a provable huge problem that was actually killing a lot of people, then and, and we really had replacements for fossil fuels, then we should talk about, OK, how do we define something like a threshold? I just don't think we're there. But absolutely, you don't want to have it so that like many dictators get to say, oh, I'm going to jack up this price here for this externality. We need to define the rights in a rational, pro-human way. And I believe that right now, there should be no limit on CO2 because CO2 is such a necessary byproduct of something that we need to do more of, namely produce low-cost, reliable uh, energy with fossil fuels. Let me just take one thing on the foreign policy. The foreign policy, it is not fair to demonize the substance, to blame the substance on all policies that are related to the substance. Every time you're dealing with energy, there are going to be good and bad policies for relating to it. And guess what? If we build solar and wind the way we're doing, which is a lot by you know abusive Chinese labor with really dangerous mining practices of rare earth metals where they're cornering the market in China, you think that's not going to be a foreign policy issue? Dependence on you know there's dependence on Saudi oil, which we can get rid of a lot through our own production. What about you know dependence on Chinese magnets? Nobody talks about that. But so there's this bias of we're only going to talk about the negatives of fossil fuels. We're going to call renewables clean, even though there's such dirtiness in the manufacturing process. We're going to ignore all the foreign policy challenges um, with that. So I think we need a rational foreign policy. And I have huge criticisms of the way our oil policy has been um, conducted. And I think there are much better ways. But I, I don't think it's rational to say, oh, well, we shouldn't be allowed to use oil because oil policy has been conducted irrationally. And therefore, we should commit. Uh, energy genocide. OK, so I want to make sure that we get time for audience questions. So last subject, and just uh, I'll sort of cheat a little bit and, and do a twofer, uh, point of privilege. One has to do is I know you're chopping at the bit to talk about nuclear. So I'll sort of hand you the football on nuclear to respond to some of the points uh, that Mr. Epstein's, uh, Epstein's been making all night. I also just want to ask, because we're talking about uh, foreign policy, and we're talking about our nation and other nations, what do, you, what do you say to Americans who say, OK, I'm sort of on board for a lot of the points that you're making, but if we're going to do it and handcuff ourselves and possibly hurt our economy when these developing nations with billions of people aren't really going to play ball with no real skin in the game, aren't we sort of just whistling past the graveyard, not making a real dent in the problem because they're out emitting us anyway and we're hurting our economy? To what extent is American unilateralism needed leadership and how much of it would be possibly hurting our economy without other other countries playing keep up, if, if you will. And well, then go ahead I, with nuclear. I mean, you're giving me two questions. Yeah. I hope you give me double the time. I will. 
Um, and then, it's, and then all, one response, and then We questions. don't have to worry. The Chinese and the Indians don't want dirty energy. They know what it, it's killing 400,000 people a year, pollution in Beijing. China, they don't want it anymore. China is much more aggressive about adding renewables than we are. China is a very aggressive, the most aggressive for a nuke, poly, nuke <laughs> program in the world. They're adding more solar every year than their entire nuke fleet. So they, they're, you know, the, if you look at China, um, India, the United States, and Germany, the four biggest economies last year, um, we, th we reduced, the four of them together, 36 terawatts of power. And we added 39 terawatts of um, of power, and as I said, and India and China are doing their part. India just canceled 14 gigawatts of coal plants, more, a bigger fleet than, than the entire British fleet. You know, they're doing their stuff. I'll talk about nuke. Nuke, and by the way, it makes us more competitive. The more that you get rid of fossil fuels, the better quality of life, more competitive, the more we're developing technologies that the rest of the world wants. Doesn't hurt us. The IMF says reducing fossil fuels is a net benefit to our economy of $1.3 trillion. It helps us. It's not a cost. There's transition cost, but it's not a cost. Nuke. I'm all for nuke. I'm a market guy. I'm all for nuke if they can make it economic and if they can make it safe. Right? And by the way, nuke did not get destroyed, like, he said, like Alex suggested, because of environmentalists. It got destroyed because of Chernobyl and Three Mile Island. That was their problem. N nuke, if, if, if it's economic, as I say, the, the Vogtel power plant in Georgia is supposed to be $12 billion a gigawatt. It's $1 billion to build a solar plant. And guess what? The costs now look like they're going to go up to $25 billion. That's not good. I gave you what the cost of nuke is. It's five to seven times what solar is. Who would want to do that? We can build burn energy. We can make energy out of, like I said, prime rib. Why would we do that? And is it safe? Here's the thing. It's not me who's saying it's unsafe. It's the insurance industry who's saying, we, you are so hideously dangerous, we are not going to insure you. That's why the nuclear industry had to go to Congress in a sleazy legislative mo maneuver in the middle of the night and pass the Price-Anderson Act, so, which says that if a nuclear power plant explodes or has an accident and, and your house is injured, they don't have to pay you for it. That's the deal they got. What kind of deal is that? What other industry has that deal? Go look at your homeowner's policy. Everyone in the country says, we do not insure you against losses from radiation from a nuclear power plant. Uh, so you're, you have the most expensive, nobody would build a nuclear power plant unless the government intervenes. And so you have the most expensive fuel, then you have to take the fuel, the waste, and store it for 30,000 years, which is five times the length of recorded human history. How is that a moral, how can you make a moral case? This is a, what polluters do. It's a way of, of passing the cause of our generation's prosperity onto the backs of our children. It's not moral. And to pass it to, to jet to a thousand generations of children that's what he wants for the, the solution to his energy problem is make the future generations pray for, pay for it. You can't sell that as a moral cost today. Right now, we spend a hundred billion dollars, a hundred million dollars a year. You, taxpayers paying to store nuclear radiation, waste radiation on site at all these power plants and it's gonna double and triple every year. Why should taxpayers have to pay that? Utilities should have to pay that. We, you know, Alex does not believe in markets. He believes in the kind of energy that he's talking about. If you look at it, which is big um, hydro, uh, carbon energy, and, 
and wind and a nuke, what do they have in common? They all can be controlled by wealthy billionaires. And what I want, and you know, if we do that, if we have an energy, the, the political system tends to reflect the economic system. And if we have an economic system that's controlled by a few people, we will lose our democracy too. And what I'm suggesting is let's get a energy system that all of us can participate in that okay. democratizes it. So last response before we get to audience questions, specifically on nuclear power, uh, the issue of cost, the issue of safety. Yeah, so um, I've sort of been consistently saying that what's happening with Robert, but it's not about Robert, it's about the way the culture and particularly many of the thought leaders who like I would call the environmental thought leaders think or, or think improperly is that they they just consistently ignore or dismiss the amazing unique benefits of fossil fuels and they consistently exaggerate, really wildly exaggerate and distort side effects. And I think it's interesting to see this done in the case of nuclear and we could have a whole uh, discussion about nuclear, but I'll just give you, uh, like just take one thing in terms of the safety. If you want to measure how safe something is, one good way to do it is to measure, I think the best way is how many deaths occur per unit of energy produced. And guess what the safest form of energy ever created is? By far, nuclear. Now, you mentioned, so Chernobyl, that was, um, I mean, not even that many deaths by the standard of many other things, but Chernobyl was a Soviet thing controlled by a totalitarian government. Um, in terms of the actual free world with any kind of civilized laws, the example he gave was Three Mile Island, right? So Three Mile Island, how many people died from radiation there? Zero people uh, died from there. So what is going on? Why is it hard to ensure nuclear? The reason why nuclear has difficulty and the reason why nuclear costs have dramatically increased in multiple decades, despite the fact that knowledge of how to do it has increased, you'd expect it to become more efficient, is because, as I said, it's been, it's been demonized and criminalized by the modern environmental movement. And part of that is, is that there's such hysteria and demonization around nuclear where people are terrified of being sued for any kind of crazy thing related to nuclear. It's not that it's actually going to kill you, it's the least likely thing uh, to kill you. He mentioned nuclear plant exploding. Nuclear plants can't uh, explode. The, the, the radioactive material in them cannot explode physically. So what's that? Yeah, no, that was not an explosion of the radioactive material. That was like an explosion of like um, a hydrogen thing there. <laughs> Okay, well, so Fukushima is also interesting because Fukushima was also uh, zero deaths. The only deaths that come from these things are deaths from hysterically moving people out of the area, which particularly hurts older people. So what I just want to stress is there's a lot more to say about nuclear, but I mean, the fact is that nuclear is actually providing low-cost, reliable electricity, certainly compared to what renewables have done in Germany, uh, in France. And so if you actually believed in an existential threat from rising CO2 levels, you'd really place priority on nuclear. Now, what you're hearing tonight is just that, oh, well, solar and wind, even with everything I've said, even though they've had decades, even though they have this fundamental problem of the unreliable fuel, even though they always require the unreliable energy infrastructure plus the reliable energy infrastructure, even though they always increase the cost, essentially what he's saying is, I, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., contradict all of that. I've got this amazing market, which hasn't been defined at all, in which these unreliables that actually are the worst performing things are somehow going to be the best performing things, and so we need to implement that in some magical way, and I'm not going to be clear at all about what's prohibited and what's not, and Alex is against market. So what I'm saying is, no, we need to be free to pursue all forms of energy. We need to clearly define rights based on actual science, not pseudoscience and uh, distortions. And we need to stop this bias against fossil fuels, nuclear, and hydro. He says, I like them because wealthy billionaires are involved in them. No, it's the exact opposite. People become wealthy billionaires involved in them because they're actually good technologies, just like people become wealthy billionaires on the internet because it's valuable. Jeff Bezos becomes a wealthy billionaire because it's valuable, because he can deliver a low-cost, valuable product to a lot of people. Um, profitably. So that's what is not doable by right now, these imaginary energy industries. I wish you and all of your investments the best of luck, but you need to compete on a real market with profits, not on some sort of 
uh, not on a market, not on a non-market that prohibits us from using the most important form of energy in our lives. Okay, so we're going to put uh, a well, pin. Let me just say this: I, that the insurance industry, AIG, <laughs> AIG, Swiss Re, um, Munich Re, are the ultimate arbiters of risk in our society. They're not stupid people. They're not running away from an investment if they can make money. And you know, for you to say they don't know what they're talking about, and you know more about the risk from nuclear power plants than them is a or we're departing from fact-based reality. You know, you're, you're saying the meteorology, you know more than the meteorologist, more than, than the pulmonologist, more than the climatologist, more than the toxicologist, you know, more than the insurance industry. And it's just, at some point, we have to wonder whether we can trust that, you know, that judgment. Okay, so, so I, I think... I know, that the, I know that the environmentalists have made nuclear, have, have allowed all kinds of crazy lawsuits for nuclear that insurance companies wouldn't want to insure. That's why I say stop demonizing and decriminalizing. Do you think morally that we should be able to impose on our generations of children to take care of that Oh yeah, that to address for that years. First of all, there are technologies for is dealing that a moral, with that. Is that, can you make a moral case for I that? I did so well. No, no, you need to. <laughs> Until yes, the very end. Yes, because if you can make it, you can make it safe, you can actually transform it um, into energy. I don't know why you're assuming that we have to leave it in the most precarious form Because nobody's uh, figured out forever. how to do anything actually else they, with actually it, they, okay, Actually, so. they have, and nobody is dying from that waste, but people are dying for lack of low-cost, reliable energy that okay. you and your friends are prohibiting. So we will, we will s stipulate profound disagreements uh, for the moment, and I'd like to welcome to the stage. Uh, my time here, blessedly, is now over, <laughs> and I will turn it over to a member of the faculty here at CU. His name is Matt Burgess. He specializes in environmental studies and economics, and he's going to be moderating the Q&A from the audience. My only contribution to this part is to say, a brief reminder, that for our purposes, especially with how long we have left, 10, 15 minutes, a question is one to two sentences with a question mark at the end of it, please. So, are we going to line up with mics? Is that is the microphone okay. right so we in the middle? Up with mics. Um, the Heidi said we have 20 minutes, regardless if we go over a little bit over. And I just want to say, I just want to say a couple things. Um, one is that I think polar, regardless of what we think about this issue, I think we can all agree that polarization is really hurting our ability to solve big problems. And so I think it's great and really important that we have these kinds of conversations. I agree. And then secondly, while there are definitely big problems across the country and across the English-speaking world, in fact, in college campuses, I just want to point out that CU is a leader in a positive direction. Where are the protest mobs? I don't see any. I also don't see any metal detectors. And I want to acknowledge our, our regents um, and, and, uh, and, and some of our other campus leaders for enshrining some of those, those values. We have protections for free speech and academic freedom and non-discrimination on political grounds. So use that freedom. Freedom is useless if you don't act free. Um, so, go, so, so go forth and, and, and use that in your, your questions. Show time? Okay, there we go. Um, so Alex, you said something about rare earth minerals that I really want to follow up on. Um, and I've heard a lot about the environmental damages and danger to mining rare earth minerals, specifically cobalt. And it don't, I don't think it's something we really talk about enough um, and how those minerals are used in the renewable technology. And that in the United States, we could mine them, but they would violate our EPA laws, so we can't. So then we purchase them from other countries. And as a young generation, as a millennial, that, that really bothers me that we don't look at that side of the coin, that we just ignore that. So I'd like to understand why. Why is this not something that we're saying when solar panels are so great, why don't we talk about this? Um, uh, thank you for the question. And, and I think you, you, you stated a lot of true facts in the question, so I don't have anything to argue with in the facts that you mentioned. The question of, of why is, so I'd put it on two levels. One is that there's this clear, t I mentioned this clear tendency to ignore the benefits of fossil fuels and exaggerate and distort the side effects. Related to that is there's this tendency to uh, understate the side effects of certain forms of energy, namely solar and wind, and to uh, ignore the downsides. And so 
and, and, to, well, and to exaggerate the benefits. I think what's going on is we could ask, why is there such an obsession with renewable, but not just renewable, but solar and wind? Why aren't we just focused on what's really the best energy? And I believe that it's because we have this idea that we shouldn't be impacting the planet. And people think, although incorrectly, as your question implies, that solar and wind are somehow perfectly natural and in harmony with nature. And therefore, it has this idea of, yeah, we're not going to really disturb the planet. We're just going to take the sun in. And as you're indicating, that is total nonsense, because you need a whole process to convert energy, and including to make the unreliable uh, reliable. And so it's, it's this massive process, and there are all these ignored practices. Now, this doesn't mean I don't think that solar and wind should be prohibited. I just think that we should have rights protecting policies with the different practices for rare earths. I mean, but rare earths do have a lot of dangers with them, but I think that you can have good uh, laws about them. But I would, I would really encourage people to reject this idea that we should be choosing things based on how natural they are. We should be choosing things based on how beneficial to human beings they are. And that's why I choose things. Not whether billionaires are involved, but how good things are on balance for human beings. Mr. Kennedy. Hi. Um, so I want to thank you guys both for coming. Uh, I guess it struck me throughout the discussion that the kind of a core disagreement both of you have is how easy it will be to actually make the transition to renewable fuels. It strikes me there's a policy you guys could potentially agree on. If you put a price directly on carbon, not a cap and trade system, not regulations, but said we're going to have a price on it and rebate the money, if you're right, Alex, uh, then, you would, then you would not see much emissions reductions and you would get mild wealth redistribution and society would go on flourishing. And if you're right, Robert, then we would reduce emissions very, very quickly. Is that, am I, am I wrong here? Is that something that you guys both couldn't support? A price on carbon that rebates the money is an effective bet to see who's right about just how hard it is to transition off. Well, Let's start with Mr. Kennedy oh, this time. Oh, sorry. I'm for it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I mean, I, 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 there, there's a lot of different structures for, you know, for doing carbon pricing, and they're all interesting. And but I, what what I think is that we should have markets. That if people are going to dump something into the common space, the commons, they ought to pay the cost of that. And Alex says there is no cost. The, the Arctic's not melting. The sea level's not rising. The glaciers aren't melting on every continent. The oceans aren't acidifying, and you know, so that's to me that's the problem. If we had, could agree on kind of the facts, there's no mercury in our, you know, in our fish, et cetera. Then I think we can agree on a pricing mechanism. But there's lots of attractive pricing mechanisms, or imposing market discipline on the discharge of pollutants. Mr. Epstein. Okay. Well. You can solve that problem by recognizing what I actually said, which is that I do believe those things happen. They're just being wildly exaggerated, and they're much smaller than the benefits we're getting. And also, I said we need. I did not say you can just dump anything anywhere. I said we need to uh, develop. We need to define rights based on sci actual science and actual what's actually going to benefit human beings. Um, so no, I mean, what's going to happen is you know what you do with these taxes is you're making energy. The, the way it works is usually that you're making like. You're, the idea is usually you rebate it. It's usually you rebate it to consumers, right? So what's happening is, and people think, oh, they call it net new. Um, what is it? Um, revenue neutral. Revenue neutral, rather. I'm sorry. So it's called revenue neutral, and people think, oh, this is really good. Revenue neutral must be neutral, but revenue neutral just means from the perspective of the government. The government isn't going to take it and spend it on something else. It's going to be given to you. But the issue is not what's happening with the government. It's what's happening with individual productive decisions, because the whole purpose of the tax is for less money to go into the lowest cost energy production, and that's going to make things more expensive everywhere. And this is what happened. I mean, we have a lot of case studies. Like in Australia, they passed a carbon tax. It drove up their energy, their electricity prices by 20%. And they rebelled against it because it was increasing their cost of living. So the last thing you want to do is do anything to make energy more expensive, because the lower, the higher cost energy is, the higher cost uh, everything is. I want to make one other note about, and this relates to Guy's question about, should we unilaterally do things as the US? What I'm really scared about in the world is not a global radical restriction of fossil fuels, because many countries are way too smart to do this. Uh, in this kind of renewables delusion that we've heard tonight, one thing is that China 
is somehow like really pro-renewables. They built 60 coal plants in 2018 in China and commissioned 90 around the world. So they're really, really pro-coal. They seem to have not discovered the magic of ultra cheap uh, renewables. And so what's gonna happen and what does happen if we make our energy more expensive, we just, del we just make other companies who have truly lower cost energy more competitive and we outsource our emissions and we also outsource it to companies with more emissions in, in general, so no. Um, I think that whether you define a law like that, the only reason would be you'd have to be really confident that there's a real disaster that we can actually do something about with the law. And if there was a real disaster, you'd have to do something globally, not make a senseless unilateral sacrifice um, that wouldn't actually do anything globally. Okay, which let's is move like on to another New Deal. question. That's okay. Yes. Uh, later. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you guys for coming out. Uh, it was really great to hear all your ideas. Um, I have a question for kind of both of you, but first Robert. So I, I actually appreciate your praise for like the free market and your distaste for subsidies and everything. But um, if solar and wind are actually um, better and cheaper than the forms of fossil fuels that um, you were talking about, why do you need to ban fossil fuels in order to beat them in the market um, since you're such a proponent of the why free market? Why do you need to ban them? Yeah, why do you need to ban them? Uh, I've said from the beginning, I'm not for banning them. You support the Green New Deal though. Oh, yeah. I, I didn't say that. But oh, you did. Well, in reality, he did it. So not on this stage. I, I'm going to use. I'm going to take so, moderator's you know, privilege I, here. Well, let me, he, let he me did, make it clear then. Uh, let yeah. me make it clear. He I don't support a ban on fossil fuels. What I support are market mechanisms, and to the extent that that's part of the Green New Deal, I don't support that part of it. Uh, I'll try to be as quick as I can. My question's more for Robert. Um, Robert, in the wake of the Greta Thunberg skeptical, spectacle, uh, it became something of a joke uh, uh, on, in my Twitter circles and friend circles. Greta Th Thunberg. Thunberg, sorry. I'm the young woman. To speak fast. Um, that, you know, lefty journalists and, and, you know, people trying to prescribe everyday solutions for people were basically prescribing three main things being eat bugs, have less kids, and eat less meat. Um, and at, at the end of the day, I... I if that's what it takes to kind of be an environmentalist, I'm fundamentally unwilling to play ball. Because at the end of the day, because at the end of the day, if, if Mr. Epstein is a, a bought and paid for Koch brother shill and all the things you would suggest he is, I'll side with him first on the matter of human dignity because I don't want to sell my family out first. So is it, well, what was the question? So I, so, so I guess the, the question would be about, you know, we do hear from some environmentalists, it's like morally wrong to have kids or too many kids that's a, that's a tough Listen, sell. I, I have nothing but admiration for Greta but what is she 12 years old 16 what? she's 16 so I mean I, you know her she's trying to do something idealistic she has a legitimate worry about the you know the state of the globe and I admire her for that um, do I would I go to her and say if let's say if I were president would I appoint her the um, Secretary of Energy? No. <laughs> I wouldn't, because I don't think a 16-year-old girl has that level of sophistication. When I was 16, I didn't. I saw things that were wrong. I felt an urgency to change them, and that's what she's trying to do. But I don't think that you should make up your mind about what environmentalists stand for and what they don't by listening to, you know, to somebody who is that age. I, you know, I put, laid out a platform tonight that I think is a rational, pragmatic platform that people that, that, that supports American values, that supports free market capitalism, that rationalizes our marketplace so that, um, you know, a market does what it's supposed to do, which is to reward good behavior and punish bad behavior. I believe in free market capitalism because I believe that the marketplace promotes efficiency. Efficiency means the elimination of waste. Pollution <laughs> is waste. A free market would, would urge us to properly value our natural resources, and it's the undervaluation of those resources that causes us to use them wastefully. In a true free market, you can't make yourself rich without making your neighbors rich and without enriching your community. What polluters do is they make themselves rich by making everybody else poor. 
They raise standards of living for themselves by lowering quality of life for everybody else. And they do that by escaping the discipline of the free market and Thank forcing the public to pay their production costs. You show me a polluter, I'll show you a fat cat using political clout to escape the discipline of the free market and force the public to pay his costs. And Thank you. Let's move on to another question. Let's move on to another question. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I have a brief question for each of you. Mr. Kennedy, what are your criticisms of hydro? And Mr. Epstein, is there any place for government funded research into nuclear power? Let's start government with Mr. Epstein. Uh, what, what are your criticisms of hydroelectric power? Well, I don't like big hydro. I like, you know, there's a lot of little hydro and in-river hydro that's very interesting now and that I would support. I've supported a couple of projects in Chile, but I think big hydro is a boondoggle at it, um, that, it, uh, that it's not cost effective in many cases and that over, over time, uh, with the reason dams are coming down now is not because environmentalists suddenly got powerful, it's that the dams don't work anymore. They fill up with silt, they destroy the rivers, they destroy other values. So I would say I wouldn't outlaw hydro. I'd, if I could find another way to make energy that was cheap and reliable, I would do it. And solar and wind are cheap and reliable. Mr. Epstein? Um, Okay, I'll answer your question in five seconds so I can address what he said. So the, um, no, I mean, what needs to happen with nuclear is the whole, I mean, I mentioned stop demonizing and criminalizing, like you need a whole, a new infrastructure, not a new infrastructure, rather, you need a set of laws that ha uh, hold nuclear to objective safety standards compared to everything else. Right now, there's just this prejudice where nuclear, even though it's the safest, has to do the most and so if you make some, if you impose enough safety regulations on things, then it just becomes impossible to afford. It's just like if you said, well, to be safe, Alex, you have to go around with five bodyguards all the time. Yeah, then I couldn't afford to live. That wouldn't actually help my life. And that's basically what we have um, with nuclear. I want to make a response to just this idea of does Robert support the Green New Deal and this market thing. Like, you haven't said anything really specific about this, what this would be. You've promised a lot of things in terms of these technologies that fail would somehow succeed. But I remember at the outset, you talked about net metering. So that's the most concrete thing I've heard. And so we might, let's talk about net metering for one second. So net metering basically means you're saying, I'm generating unreliable energy from my home, and I want to be paid. In practice, what net metering means is you get paid over twice the whole t wholesale price. So basically, you get paid twice as much for energy that is unreliable. Wow, I wonder why people don't like that and resist that. Yeah, they don't want to overpay a bunch of so-called no, no, energy that's not generators. What I said. That no, you, you I don't said think negative net should pay. I well, do that's, not that's think what net you metering laws do. Market price. That's, no, no, no. But they they want to be paid the retail price, not who the does? wholesale who price. Who are you talking about? Every advocate of okay, net metering. I think we should move on. Well, we should take, let's take two me. more questions. Okay, well, that's just uh, that's uh, that's another debating trick, putting words in my mouth. And I'm having you support your Let's move on to another question. Thanks. Policies that are, you're actually supporting in Thanks reality everyone. that will be passed. Next question. Hi, I just wanted to thank both of you for coming out, and I just appreciate um, civilized discussion. But I just wanted to <laughs> ask a question um, about a comment you made earlier, Alex. So I heard you say that um, there used to be levels of um, CO2 uh, ten times as high as they are today, but um, the organisms back then were completely different, entirely different, adapted and evolved for 10 times higher CO2. So if um, as CO2 is rising as it is today, um, organisms, uh, us, what we have today, if, if we have to adjust to that overnight, I think that'd be a lot different. Um, wouldn't it be cheaper to try to um, adjust for that now and prepare for that now by, through innovation and renewable resources rather than just like patching that up with a temporary solution through say fossil fuels? Um, Mr. Epstein? So just to take the, the, the incorrect factual assumption, uh, many, many of our plants are actually uh, were, were developed in eras with much more CO2 than we have today. So I mean, in general, what, what has happened with more CO2 is a lot more global greening, which has been a huge net benefit, which is another case where the benefits of fossil fuels um, are being ignored. And again, the side effects are being wildly exaggerated. Uh, and distorted. And the whole, your whole question is, well, shouldn't we do this with innovation and renewable? 
renewables. Well, first of all, forget renewable as a concept. I don't care whether it's renewable or natural or whatever. I want it to be good. So yes, we should support innovation, but that means freedom, including stop the criminalization of nuclear, as I keep referring to. But if you're talking about, oh, shouldn't we just do this and get rid of fossil fuels? No, because that means getting rid of the quality of life of billions of human beings, which has been my whole point tonight. This is an unbelievable value in our lives that we don't realize how good it is. And we don't realize that what we're taking for granted is the most amazing life anyone has ever had. And it's because there's this one industry that's figured out how to produce low cost, reliable energy for all of our different needs for billions of people. That is an unbelievable achievement. We should welcome others approximating that achievement, but nobody has come close. And if we want our standard of living and billions more want it, we need to leave the fossil fuel industry free to produce energy, and we need to be free to willingly buy it. Mr. Mr. Kendi, do you want 30 seconds to respond and then we'll take one last question? No, I, I would just point out another thing, which is that last week the Ohio State Legislature, which are essentially indentured servants for um, the, you know, the incumbents, the energy incumbents, voted to bail out the utility in Ohio to the tune of $1 billion because of cost overruns at their nuclear power plant. Oh, I mean, does anybody, I, I don't even understand where, you know, this is socialism for the rich. It's socialism for, you know, these incumbents. And it's a very cushy socialism for them and a ruthless, merciless capitalism for everybody else. Okay, we'll take one last question. Uh, <laughs> think, I'm, I'm being told one more, so let's. <laughs> so my question yeah, is for you. I understand that you believe that fossil fuels might not end the world like tomorrow, but empirically, fossil fuels are going to stop being sustainable at some point in time. So why would we not start transitioning now if we can? And realistically, isn't it truly moral to moral to prioritize our future today instead of just waiting until climate change eventually does become that apocalyptic scenario that you're talking about? Okay. Mr. Epstein? Yeah, so there's kind of these two apocalypses, these two contradictory apocalypses. One is we're not going to have enough fossil fuels, and the other is we're going to have, too, we're going to have not enough, and we're going to run out, and we're going to have too much, and it's going to cause a, a, a catastrophe. And so I think we need to look at, with, with having not enough, we're, people are constantly, if there's freedom, they're constantly searching out better ways to produce energy. Now, often the best way to produce energy is more fossil fuels, but the fact that we use fossil fuels now or in 10 years doesn't mean that people aren't looking for better alternatives. They are all the time, and that's why I'm so emphatic about being free to pursue all alternatives instead of this religiously restricted, oh, let's just do renewables or small renewables or unreliable renewables. Um, in terms of climate, that's just a total assumption that that's going to be an apocalypse that we're gonna, we've changed the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere from 0.03% to 0.04%, then we might change it to 0.05%, and that's gonna be a disaster. This is, the assumption here is that significant human impacts on nature are inevitably self-destructive, uh, whereas the reality is, is that sometimes our impacts can be destructive, but overwhelmingly what we need to do is massively impact the Earth to have a good life for human beings. Before humans massively impacted the Earth, life was terrible. Like, you know, you could be rich only if you exploited other people. Robert mentioned slavery at the beginning. Why did slavery end? Well, one big reason is we harness low-cost, reliable energy from fossil fuels, so people stop trying to harness energy uh, from humans. So in terms of our future, we can have an amazing future. If we're free to use all forms of energy, we can keep having huge benefits from fossil fuels. We can keep having very manageable side effects. We can find better things. And life can get better and better for more people, just as it's gotten better and better for billions of people in the last 40 years. So 40 years ago, people were saying, let's stop using fossil fuels. And if that had happened, billions of people today would have shorter life expectancies. What I'm saying is those same, calls now, those same calls now are being said for now. What I'm saying is we're free to use fossil fuels and other forms of energy. Life can continue to get better for billions of people. And if we radically restrict it, then it's gonna get li life is going to get worse for billions of people. It's Mr. Kennedy, simple. do you want a quick response? Yeah, I mean, I like mention, you know, uh, the end of slavery, because a more efficient form of energy came along. And I, it, it, it sent me to remembering that when I was in college, I took a course, which was a course about the moral justifications for slavery. And it was the same kind of justifications you hear for fossil fuels today, that, you know, the, it came from the Greeks, it came from the Egyptians, that, 
slavery, allowed leisure time, allowed us to create art, and then it came from preachers in the South, and there were a lot of sermons that we had to read about people who were quoting the Bible to justify slavery, so to do it. The reason slavery ended in this country was not because a more efficient fuel came along or because it was immoral. It's because we beat them in a war. And that, that energy source was willing, in order to hang on to their profits and their <laughs> old, immoral, discredited form of producing energy, they were willing to destroy this country. They were willing to kill 669,000 Americans. And that's what happens. It was a very, very difficult transition. And the economic stake of fossil fuel industry in this antiquated model is at least as great as the slave owners had in the South. So yeah, there's gonna be a struggle to transition. We're just gonna transition because simply because we're more efficient. We can produce energy cheaper than they can. And we're doing it today. It's cheaper, it's more reliable, and that is why it's going to change. Thanks, everyone. I, think, I have a yes or no question. Please I think I've been told that we have one, that, that, that was the last question. So I'm just going to thank all our debaters and uh, welcome uh, Madison Meeks. University level have come to find that the university truly is a bubble. So I want to thank all of our speakers for coming here and popping a little bit of our Boulder bubble. Yeah. I also want to thank our student leaders from Free to Be for helping our event move so slowly or so s <laughs> <laughs> so swiftly. <laughs> And I want to thank all of you for being here because you guys truly are the push for intellectual diversity at our university level. My name's Theodosia Hamilton Ferguson. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been grounded in uh, Justice Begins with Seed and Soil Not Oil for six years now. And I have the honor of presenting our very great speaker today. Our keynote speaker, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. <laughs> our keynote speaker is not only a humanitarian, but one of the greatest defenders of the planet. He has served as president of Waterkeeper Alliance Chairman of the Board and Chief Legal Counsel for Children's Health Defense. He was previously Chief Prosecuting Attorney for the Hudson River Keeper, Senior Attorney for the National Resources Defense Council, and a Clinical Professor and Supervising Attorney at Pace University School of Law's Environmental Litigation Clinic. His reputation as a resolute defender of the environment and children's health stems from a litany of successful legal actions. He has worked on environmental issues across the Americas and has assisted several indigenous tribes in Latin America and Canada in successfully negotiating treaties protecting traditional homelands. Mr. Kennedy has a long list of published books, including the New York Times bestseller, Crimes Against Nature named one of Times Magazine's Heroes of the Planet for his success keeping Riverkeeper lead, uh, lead the fight to restore the Hudson River. Let us all welcome at Soil Not Oil, Robert F. Kennedy, Jr. Thank you very much. I'm very, very happy to be here in San Francisco. I've spent a lot of the last year living in San Francisco because we had the three Monsanto cases here. And for the, I guess, in all of, most of June and July of last year, I was living at the Holiday Inn. Um, 
with my son. I had a 16-year-old son who was a, working as kind of a paralegal and a gopher for one of the other firms that was involved in the case. And it was just an amazing, magical summer for me. And at the end of that case, we won a $289 million verdict, which was... I'll tell you how kind of I got involved in that case and in doing the stuff that I'm doing. I've spent uh, since 1984, so basically 35 years, um, representing Waterkeeper Alliance and Riverkeeper groups, including the San Francisco Baykeeper here. We, we now have 350 waterkeepers around the world in 44 countries. Here, First one started on the Hudson River, and it was started by a blue-collar coalition of commercial and recreational fishermen who mobilized to reclaim the river from its polluters. Um, and they first organized in 1966. I went to work for them in 1984. They were still a very small group. And they, one of the things they taught me was that we're not protecting the environment so much for the sake of the fishes and the birds. We're protecting it for our own sake because we recognize that nature is the infrastructure of our communities. And if we want to meet our obligation as a generation, as a civilization, as a nation, which is to create communities for our children that provide them with the same opportunities for dignity and enrichment and prosperity and, and good health as the communities that our parents gave us, We've got to start by protecting our environmental infrastructure, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the wildlife, the fisheries, the public lands, those assets that cannot be reduced to private property ownership because by their nature, they are the resources of the community, what we call historically the commons or the commonwealth or the public trust resources, the, the landscapes, the rivers, the beaches, um, that connect us to our past, to our history, that provide context to our communities, and that are the source, ultimately, of our, of our values, our virtues, our character as a people, and our identity. And I spent my initial years fighting polluters on the Hudson. We brought over 500 successful legal actions on the Hudson. We forced polluters on the river to spend over five and a half billion dollars during the years that I worked for Riverkeeper as their senior attorney. And today the Hudson is the result of our work. When I went to work for the Hudson, it was dead for 20 mile stretches north of New York City. South of Albany, zero dissolved oxygen. It turned different colors depending on, on what color they were painting the trucks at the GM plant in Terrytown. It, um, it and many of the species were declining today. Uh, Hudson is an international model for ecosystem protection. It is the, it's the richest. It's the richest waterway in the North Atlantic. It produces more pounds of fish per acre more biomass per gallon than any other waterway in the Atlantic Ocean north of the equator. It's the last major river system left in the Atlantic that still has strong spawning stocks of all of its historical species of migratory fish. So it's Noah's Ark, it's a species warehouse, it's the last refuge for many of these animals that are going extinct elsewhere. And the miraculous resurrection of the Hudson has inspired the creation of now, as I said, about 350 water keepers around the world. We, have, we run now Water Keeper Alliance, which is the umbrella group that licenses the new water keepers. Um, and San Francisco Bay Keeper, which was one of the original keepers, has a permanent place on the board of the Water Keeper Alliance. But the lawsuits that I was bringing during all those years were what we call statutory lawsuits. There are Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, Endangered Species Act, CERCLA, RICRA, Safe Drinking Water Act, et cetera. And for those lawsuits, you can sue for injunctive relief. You can force the defendant to pay your attorney's fees if you win. 
And there are penalties usually of about $35,000 a day, potential penalties. But, and sometimes you'll have thousands of violations. But the courts will rarely award the full penalty. So you end up settling these lawsuits. We'd be very excited if we got a million dollar settlement in a lawsuit and injunctive relief. But, and I did that for many years. But it didn't really seem to change corporate behavior a lot. And then in 2007, a friend of mine named Mike Papantonio, who's a, a famous lawyer, trial lawyer, he invited me and he had worked with me to start a Pensacola Bay Keeper. He invited me to try a case with him in Spelter, West Virginia against DuPont. And I ended up going down to West Virginia for a six-week jury trial. And at the end of that case, and I did the closing statement and a lot of other stuff in the case. At the end of the case, the, the jury awarded us what was really one of our record verdict in, in West Virginia at that time, which was $55 million. And um, when we finished that case, the attorney for the defendants picked up her phone and walked into the hallway and somebody overheard her. She was talking to the CEO of the company and it was very clear that the CEO was going to call other board members and say, we have to do something different or you have to tell them something. And I had never had that experience where any of my cases were probably even noticed by the CEO. And I realized at that time that there was a, um, a tort lawsuits were a huge weapon for changing corporate behavior of some of the worst polluters in our country. I started doing some of those lawsuits at that time and then I got married to a California girl. My wife is Cheryl Hines, who's the actress from Curb Your Enthusiasm. It was six years ago and I moved out of here and I started kind of doing those cases full time and I did the fire case. I did a lot of different cases and I had really good results on them. And we ended up trying the Monsanto case. And the first case that we tried with Monsanto um, we tried here and we got the $289 million verdict. And Monsanto that same month had been purchased by, and this was one of the, you know, the, the most brilliant um, transactions by a company by Monsanto, and the worst transaction in history, potentially by Bayer. The same month that our trial started, they consummated their deal to sell Monsanto for $63 billion. Monsanto shareholders and their officers all made out like bandits. But Bear's total price now, last week, the analysts announced that the total value of Bear is now $63 billion. So the same price they paid, so Monsanto has zero value at this point because of these losses. We tried our next lawsuit in the federal court here in San Francisco. First case was in front of Judge Belenas and the Superior Court was at the state court. The second case we tried in the, um, in the federal court and we won 80 and it was a much tougher case. We won, I think, 81 million and then the third case we went over to Oakland and it was actually a tough case too. And we didn't have as great a confidence. The jury here in San Francisco was amazing. One of the things that happened during that case is, you know, when you come in to pick a jury, there's a jury pool, so there's a room with about this many people in it all waiting to get on the jury. You have to choose 16 of them. We get six preemptory challenges. The other side gets six preemptory challenges. That means we can pick out somebody and say, we just don't like them. We don't have to explain why. We don't like them and we get rid of them. And, but and there are unlimited challenges for cause. So if somebody gets up there and says, I cannot be fair to this defendant, 
then either side can say, you know, they're out and you don't get penalized for it. And this case was a record because 35 San Franciscans got up there one after the other and said, I cannot be fair to this company because it's the most evil company in the world. <laughs> we not, nobody ever seen anything like and it shocked the Monsanto lawyers how despised their client was. And, and um, so but the last case, we had a big argument the night before the case among all the attorneys as to what the, as the jury, it's always a big strategic question about do you ask the jury for, a low, do you lowball them or do you highball them? And, you know, we had got, we had asked the initial jury for 300 million, they gave us 189. And we all said, that's what we should ask him for again, the Oakland jury. But Brent Wisner, who is a superstar, very 34-year-old lawyer who was the lead counsel in the case, said, I want to ask him for a billion. And uh, we were all saying, we don't think you should do that, Brent, because it might just piss them off and they could go the other way. He ended up asking him for a billion and they came back with two billion. Uh-oh. <laughs> He was right. But if I was, um, if my life was a Superman comic, Monsanto would be Lex Luthor. Because I feel like my whole life I've been fighting them. And in fact, for, the 30, for 30 years on the Hudson River, I was in litigation against General Electric Company to get Monsanto's PCBs out of the Hudson River. Oh, it consumed a lot of my life, this company. But even before that, when, you know, this is a company that has made a business model out of taking the worst chemicals in the world and saying, uh, and saying we're going to sell them. In fact, during the San Francisco trial, one of the jurors stood up and said, I cannot be fair to this company because they made Agent Orange and they sprayed it all over me and my friends when we were in Vietnam and a lot of my friends died of cancer. And the judge immediately got rid of that juror. And during the jury instructions, the judge actually told the jurors, ignore everything that you heard about Agent Orange. Um, and my wife really laughed at that because she was at that. And she was saying, if you tell somebody to pretend you didn't hear it, does it just make you think that that's all you want to think about? <laughs> uh, but then the I think the judge realized that, and she said to the jury, Monsanto never made Agent Orange, which just wasn't true. Of course they made Agent Orange. Well, anyway, it was one of those bizarre parts of the trial. But... Um, so, you know, I and my uncle and my family was deeply involved in the Agent Orange controversy. My uncle had the hearings that finally got the Department of Defense and the CDC to admit that Agent Orange was causing all these cancers and autoimmune problems and other injuries to our troops and forcing the Veterans Administration to treat them. But when I was an eight-year-old boy, I was already a big environmentalist, and I... Um, I knew about Rachel Carson, and her book came out in 1962. My uncle was president. She was attacked viciously by Monsanto. A lot of people, when we were trying the Monsanto case, would say, oh, they're using the tobacco playbook, because they were using all the same methodologies that Big Tobacco had pioneered. And I knew it wasn't the tobacco playbook, it was the Monsanto playbook that tobacco had borrowed from Monsanto. I'm going to add some bells and whistles to it, but Monsanto really invent, invented it. They brought in Hill and Knowlton. They brought in um, Edelman, the PR firms, and created all these phony front groups and, um, and you know, devised the strategy of getting trusted third party scientists and organizations. They got the AMA, the American Medical Association, to attack Rachel Carson. They got the garden clubs, the American Garden Club, 
to attack her. They got editorials in Life magazine and Time magazine and Sports Illustrated going after her. She never defended herself because she was dying of cancer at that time. But she, she was this extraordinary woman who was born in Pennsylvania, in a rural part of Pennsylvania. She became one of the great oceanologists, marine biologists, but she never saw the ocean until she was 22 years old. And she was a brilliant writer. That was her gift of taking scientific concepts and translating them into beautiful poetic language. And her book became one of the great bestsellers in history at that time. I think it was on the bestseller list for something like 82 weeks. And um, even, of course, Monsanto had gotten the USDA to to be the spear tip of its juggernaut. And it was my uncle's USDA, he was the president. They were viciously attacking, and they all, all of these people used the same talking points, and you can go back now and read the critiques of Rachel Carson. They all used the same language. Almost all of them characterized her as a spinster, which was the contemporary euphemism for lesbian. And they were trying to you know, discredit her in every way that they could. And as I said, she remained silent. But my uncle, who you know, could not control his USDA, um, made an end run around them by appointing a high level guy, Jerome Wisner, who was his science advisor, to appoint a high level group panel of some of the most trusted and scientists with integrity in the country. And they went through Rachel Carson's book, point by point, paragraph by paragraph, and they published a report eight weeks later that vindicated everything that she had said. And, and all the major factual assertions in that book. And as a result of that, we banned DDT in this country in 1974. It took us 10 years to do it. We passed five. Uh, we had to have Earth Day. A million, 20 million people come out onto the street. That was one of the first um, statutes that we passed, of the 28 that we passed after Earth Day, that was one of the first ones, and we banned DDT. And, and that was Monsanto's flagship chemical. And Monsanto needed to find a new chemical. And there was glyphosate, originally it was developed as a scalant remove calcium and metals accumulation from the inside of pipes and tanks, because that's what it does. It sucks the metals out. That's why, and that's how it ultimately kills plants. And, and if, you, like, if you weigh a bushel of corn today, it weighs less than a bushel of corn did 20 years ago, because the metals and the nutrients are gone from the corn, because that's one of the things Monsanto does. You're eating something that fills you up, but it has no nutrition in it, or very little. And, and it's one of the ways that, uh, that glyphosate kills plants. Glyphosate was, um, was invented, at, or it was patented originally as a scalant. At some point, somebody took a jar of it and threw it in the backyard and they noticed it killed everything green. And a scientist of Monsanto heard about it. His name was Stephen France. He took it and he said, this could be a great herbicide. So originally, when they developed it as an herbicide, it, it, the, it, the, the good part about it was that it didn't have the kind of toxicity that atrazine and some of the other herbicides had. So, um, but it was a conventional herbicide. So farmers would hire armies of farm workers and they would put backpack sprayers on. They would go through the cornfield and if they, when the corn was initially just growing, it was very young when it was just sprouting. And if there was a weed growing in the corn rows, it looked like it was going to compete with the corn. It would spray it. It would give it a spray, and it would die. And that's how. It, and it only. It was mildly successful. It had about three percent of the market. 
until 1996. And then Monsanto did something that disrupted a 40,000-year-old industry of crop farming. It invented Roundup Ready. Uh, initially, it was uh, um, Roundup Ready soybeans. That was the first one. Now it's on canola and alfalfa and corn and sorghum and everything else. But originally, the first plant they did was with the petunia. At some point, they, they sprayed a plant and the plant didn't die. And Monsanto had told the farmers, be on the lookout for that kind of thing. They brought this plant into the Monsanto lab, and they, uh, France and the other people in that lab and another company took genes out of that plant and successfully implanted them in a petunia. And they sprayed the petunia with Roundup, and it didn't die. And they knew they could do it. So then they went to work putting it into uh, soybeans. In 1996, they released Roundup Ready soybeans. Now, the farmer could fire all those farm workers and hire one guy in an airplane and spray, saturate the entire landscape with Roundup. And everything would die except for the Roundup Ready soybean. And then they put it in corn, and they put it in soy, sorghum, and they put it in canola, and oats, and everything else. And that has transformed farming. So it went from 3% to about 80% of herbicide use in the world. And then, in 2006, they made another innovation. And that innovation was they started telling farmers you don't, you can use this not just as an herbicide, but as a desiccant. Which means when the, the crops are lying in the field or they're about to harvest and the rains come and get them wet, now there's a danger of mold and they're much more difficult to harvest and storage. But if you spray them with Roundup, it will dry them out. And you won't have that problem. And about, because of the success of that method, about 80% of the Roundup that has been used in history has been used since 2006. Now, they're developing Roundup Ready wheat today, but they don't have it, and they haven't had it in the past. And it's a scary thing. But now they started spraying it on wheat for the first time in history. Not only that, they were spraying it on foods directly onto foods. Initially, they'd been spraying it in the early stages of the crop's life. But now they're spraying it directly onto food, and that's when it started showing up in all of our food. So the University of California did a study in, I think, 2015, which they found that 93% of, of urine samples that they took from across America have glyphosate in them. So it's in our cereals, it's in all of our kids' cereals, it's in your beer, it's in your wine, it's in vaccines, it's in, you know, it's in medicines. It's in, we're suing right now, um, Nature Valley um, baby foods because although they say it's all natural, it has glyphosate in it and many, many, many other products that claim to be natural are actually loaded with glyphosate because you can't get rid of it. It's everywhere. And at the same time around that era, we started seeing an explosion of these diseases that appear to, that the science says are associated with, with glyphosate, including the celiac disease began exploding. I, you know, I had 11 brothers and sisters, and I had 70 cousins, and I never knew anybody who had gluten allergies and celiac disease, but today it's everywhere. And I would say at least half the people that I know say that they have some kind of allergy to gluten or that they have some kind of sensitivity to them. And, appears, and the science indicates that it's directly linked to the glyphosate on the wheat, but also 
we know that it's connected to liver disease, to kidney disease, to particularly to non-alcoholic fatty liver cancer, which for the first time is showing up in little kids, 10-year-old kids, um, to ADD, um, it is probably linked to autism, but all of these, this cascade of chronic diseases that began afflicting Americans around the, you know, around the time of coterminous or in lockstep with the expansion of glyphosate. And other, there's other things too that are causing it, but the neurodevelopmental diseases, ADD, ADHD, speech delay, language delay, tics, Tourette syndrome, um, ASD and autism, the autoimmune diseases, uh, diabetes, which we know is linked to glyphosate, rheumatoid arthritis, Guillain-Barre, cerebral palsy, um, the allergic diseases like food allergies, peanut allergies, e eczema, and anaphylaxis and asthma, all have been connected in the scientific literature with glyphosate. And, but in this country, there is a rule in the federal court and there are analogous rules in the state courts that say that you can't sue somebody. And by the way, in 1985, 85, before they even invented Roundup Ready, corn or anything else, EPA classified glyphosate as a carcinogen, class C carcinogen. Uh, Monsanto panicked, and we got all of their emails or their, their internal correspondence at that time. They didn't have emails. And what they said is, we got to fix this. Let's hire this guy, Dr. Marvin Kushner, who's one of the world's experts on toxics and kidney diseases, et cetera. Let's hire him. We'll give him a lot of money. We'll pay him to create a study to challenge that study. Kushner, and they said that in advance before any studying that was done. Kushner came in and he said, yeah, there are kidney tumors in the rats in the study group, the rats that got the glyphosate. But guess what? I found kidney cancers in the control group. He never showed those slides. He never showed those samples to EPA. But he told them he found them. So EPA threw out that study and said, okay, we will temporarily withdraw the carcinogen classification, but only on the condition that you, Monsanto, redo the mice studies. Monsanto said yes, and that was 30 years ago, and they never did them. And now we have, you know, all of the other internal memos that, and emails now that showed us how they prevented those studies from being done. And that's what pissed off the jury. Because they knew that this was carcinogenic. And they were doing everything they could to kill the studies. They had a, a guy who was essentially working for them called Jess Rowland who was working inside, he was the head of the pesticide division at EPA for 20 years. And he was killing every study that anybody wanted to do. It was another federal agency called the ATSER that wanted, it was the Agency for Toxic Substance um, Regulation and Control, that was gonna do its own study of glyphosate. He sent a memo to Rat to his bosses at Roundup, saying, I'm going to kill this study for you guys, and when I do, you need to give me a medal. And we were able to show that to at least one of the juries. The judge wouldn't, in the first case, wouldn't let us show it to the other jury. Um, but uh, so they were controlling the agency. They had captured EPA completely. Now, there's a law in this country, there's a rule in this country that. If you want to bring a scientific hypothesis in front of a jury, it has to be more than a hypothesis. The judge will block you from, if there is kind of an innovative science that's brand new, that is not mainstream, the judge will say, we're not going to even let the jury hear that science. It's called the Daubert rule. 
And it's meant to keep kind of fringe theories from getting in front of a jury. And so, uh, in order to pass the Daubert rule, the judge has to first make a finding that the science has passed a threshold where it is now mainstream science. And in 2015, the International Agency for Cancer Research, which is part of the World Health Organization, and that is an agency that was created by all the major developed nations in the world to determine what was carcinogenic and what wasn't. And the reason for its creation was that people were concerned about carcinogens in all these countries, but they said, we have to have some uniform classification. We have to have some authoritative body so that we don't have different regulations in each country. We need to all pool our resources and we're going to create an independent agency that has the best scientists in the world and look at all the scientific literature. So on one day, one year, they'll look at caffeine and coffee. The next year, they'll look at beer. They'll look at maybe 20 substances a year. They'll look at cell phones one year. And they'll make a determination on each of those substances, what is carcinogenic, and then there's a possible carcinogen, a probable carcinogen, et cetera. And they do it for animals and they do it for people. And in 2015, they said, this is a carcinogen for animals. There are 11 studies, they all show the mice, the rats, the guinea pigs get cancer in their kidneys, their livers. If you paint it on their body with a brush, they grow tumors there. And, but they say, they said, and it's a possible human carcinogen they didn't give it a strong classification because there were 11, am I supposed to wrap it up? Okay, there are 11 of those studies and they said, and all of them said carcinogenic, but none of, them, none of them were that strong, but all of them said yes. Oh, anyway, that allowed us to get by to Albert. And once we got back to Albert and got in front of a jury, it was, you know, a dead end for, it was curtains for Monsanto. Um, but and I, I'll just, let me, let me kind of sum up, I tell it by putting this in a broader context. Monsanto and these companies like that all love to say, get off our back with your regulations because free market capitalism is what made this nation great. But if you look at their feet, rather than listening to these seductive noises that come from their mouths, they hate free market capitalism. What they want is a very cushy socialism for the rich and for big corporations and a barbaric, savage form of capitalism for the poor. And for many, many years, people have asked me, what do you think the best solution to the environment is? And I've always said the same thing. It's true free market capitalism. Because in a true free market, a true free market promotes efficiency. And efficiency means the elimination of waste. And pollution is waste. In a true free market, we would be required to properly value our natural resources, the commons. And it's the undervaluation of those resources that causes us to use them wastefully. In a true free market, you can't make yourself rich without making your neighbors rich and without enriching your community. What polluters do is they make themselves rich by making everybody else poor. They raise standards of living for themselves by lowering quality of life for the rest of us. And they do that by escaping the discipline of the free market. You show me a polluter, I'll show you a subsidy. I'll show you a fat cat using political clout to escape the discipline of the free market and force the public to pay his production costs. That's what all pollution is. In a true free market, if you're an actor in the marketplace, you pay the cost of bringing your product to market. And that includes the cost of cleaning up after yourself, which was a lesson we were all supposed to have learned in kindergarten. But what they do is they use political clout and captive agency and all of their political power to escape the discipline of the free market. I was Three days ago, I visited an old friend, Dr. Lucy Waleski, in, in the Hudson Valley. She's a member of the Rockefeller family. 
and on the Rockefeller Reserve in the Pecanico area, they don't use any pesticides, including glyphosate. And I went to her home, and I saw something that I've mourned for for years. She has flowers everywhere, and on virtually every flower there was